with no further ado, let's rock here. Uh, understanding net zero in the commercial sector, uh, season one, episode two. Uh, we did an event like this last year, uh, showcasing a prototype net zero 60,000 square foot office warehouse industrial building that we had LHB uh, designed for us. Um, the Port Authority's mission is to create quality job opportunities, expand the tax base, and advance sustainable development. And it's that last piece of our mission that we're really focused on here today. It's why we engage LHB to create this model for us. Um, why is it a 60,000 square footer? We'll get into that. Uh, our sweet spot, 50 deals over 25 years, 25, yes, 50 deals over 25 years uh, have largely been to owner users at 40 to 140,000 square foot office warehouse light industrial product with a focus on job creation. Um, Brandon from United Properties would love to see that number grow. Uh, from a developer perspective, and we'll get into all that uh, throughout the afternoon here. Um, why sustainable development? Why net zero? Uh, some of you, I don't know if this is Quicken. I need to plug this in maybe. It would seem... Ah. Okay, that's me and my big bald head. Uh, IPCC, uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, last year released a report. Uh, big numbers, uh, we need to reduce our carbon emissions 45% by the year 2030 or we will not uh, stay below a 1.5 degree Celsius rise in global average surface temperature. That's a big problem. Uh, if you're interested, go read the report. Um, but I think it caught a lot of people's attention um, and really called out the serious crisis that we face ahead of us. Uh, but you don't need to read the report. This is just a few snapshots out of my Apple News feed. Uh, I've got a topic on uh, climate change saved, and it doesn't take much. I can't even read all these as they pop up day after day after day. I maybe should have warned you, I'm going to get a little dark here, but we are going to continue to head towards the sunshine throughout the afternoon. So uh, these are issues that we in the real estate sector, we in the building sector have some impact on. This one scared the hell out of me. Uh, literally train tracks warping from these extreme heat events and starting on fire across Europe the trains themselves. The good news uh, is the next generation uh, is been taught about these issues and been taught about these problems and taught that there are some solutions. So uh, we have, uh, before we really started messing around much as humans, uh, atmospheric CO2 is about 300 parts per million, 300 ppm. Um, some of you may be familiar with an organization called 350.org, uh, founded by Bill, Bill McKibben, a uh, big climate uh, advocacy activist group, um, 350 parts per million, relatively steady state, let's say. We are well over 400 parts per million. Uh, we have breached the point of basically irreversible climate change. Uh, the last data I pulled up in the last week or so here, somebody checked me, we're at what, 412? Um, and it's not going down. So, uh, if anyone wants to get real smart about how we've changed this planet over the last 800,000 years, uh, it's a pretty big difference. Uh, we're up there at 400 whatever today. Uh, what does that mean in terms of real world impact? Some really serious stuff. 42% uh, increase in our region of the top 1% of rainfall events. Obvious increase in uh, two inch rainfall events. Heat records, this is for Minneapolis St. Paul, setting heat <clears throat> records fairly regularly. What do these impacts mean in Minnesota? Um, this is, some of you may be familiar with Dr. Mark Seeley. Uh, he's a professor at the U of M uh, in the water and climate world. Um, this means that here in Minnesota, we are putting nitrogen on our soils and our uh, farms. Later in the year, uh, biological organisms 
not surviving or changing their winter survival rates, uh, how we manage our fisheries and fishing opener, which everyone cares about, uh, invasive species, freeze-thaw cycles impacting our roads and our infrastructure, and longer mold and algae seasons. The American Public Health Association uh, has realized that these climate impacts impact our health. Uh, increases in hospital visits uh, due to air quality emissions, emergency rooms, 21 days. I don't know how many of you are allergy sufferers here, but in Minneapolis, we have increased our ragweed season by 21 days uh, as it relates to climate change impacts. Um, extreme weather events, uh, flooding, storms, wildfires. Uh, anybody hear about the 100,000 people they evacuated in California literally overnight this past week? Um, infrastructure damage, property loss, uh, waterborne illness. This guy in this toilet right here is having a real problem with climate change. Want me to take over? This, this is why I do. That is my three-month-old daughter and my 13-year-old. And yes, she has her nose pierced. Don't judge me. Um, we, uh, in the world of sustainability, sustainable development, my background, um, you hear a lot about seven generations and the great Iroquois nation, the seventh generation principle. We need to decide how we move forward as a society based on its impact on the seventh generation. We don't have seven generations. We have one. We have 12 years to get a handle on this and get moving. So, a um, little doom and gloom, uh, but there are paths forward. Um, Rick is gonna help get us there. Uh, Brandon's gonna explain how we do this in our market context, and Doug and Chris are really gonna bring it home for you all. Um, when I started at the Port Authority in 2005, uh, Rick was already working for the port, and we had been doing advanced energy modeling on all new construction for about two years at that point. And I said, Rick, this is great, but how do we do better? What's the next impetus to drive change? And Rick says, well, you know about the 110-100 rule, right? He said, no, I have no idea what the hell you're talking about. He says, well, simply put, um, every, for a business, if you spend $1 a square foot on energy, you're going to spend $10 a square foot on rent, mortgage, lease, uh, you're going to spend $100 a square foot on labor. So it's about order of magnitude. And when we talk about energy, energy efficiency, net zero, we're talking about pennies on the dollar uh, in terms of impacting decision making. Um, if we can get to labor and productivity, uh, we can influence behavior change that much more quickly. So some really smart folks at Harvard uh, did something called the COG effects study. Uh, show of hands, folks in the room familiar with the COG effects study? Wonderful. Um, so, uh, the impact of green buildings on cognitive function quantified by the Chan School of Public Health at Harvard. Uh, the little company up in the corner here that sponsored it, United Technologies, uh, that basically donated to Harvard to do this research, um, they're probably the largest building component supplier manufacturer in the world. Uh, they own Otis Elevator, uh, Carrier, the list goes on and on. Uh, so they kind of know what they're talking about. Um, let me get through the research real quick and, and I'll tell you a little story. Um, so what did they find? Basically, what they looked at was if we take carbon dioxide from 950 parts per million, which is basically the ASHRAE engineering standard for what is required in a building, if we take that down to 600, if we take our ventilation rate from 20 cubic feet to 40 cubic feet, meaning we double it, uh, and if we take down the VOCs uh, dramatically by an order of magnitude, so carpet adhesives, paint, commercial office furniture are all off-gassing VOCs into our office spaces. If we take all that stuff down, surprise, surprise, you know, our brains work better. How much better? A lot, a lot better. Crisis response, 131% better. Information usage, 300% better. Strategy, 300% better. Uh, that one we're going to skip. That's just about the study, how they did it. They've uh, run two, maybe now three years of the COG effects study, getting more and more into reality from a laboratory setting. 
uh, doesn't cost a ton to make some of these incremental improvements in ventilation. Um, but the benefits can be very stark. Uh, an eight percentile increase, uh, that's not eight percent, that's eight percentile. So do you want your staff uh, working as good or better than 80% uh, of your competitors or 88 or 90% of your competitors? It's a pretty big difference. Um, we, USGBC, brought John Mandyke from United Britain Technologies, the guy that led this study, um, to town for a conference, what was that, Sherry, two years ago? Three? Um, and we had a chance to have dinner with him. And at one point I turned to him and said, John, I said, you know, don't you get kind of a hard time that you guys funded this study at Harvard and you, you know, basically the results of the study are, say, buy more equipment from us. Um, and he said, you know, we had no choice. We were doing this research with private sector clients on Wall Street, on trading floors of Wall Street. And when they would see the data and we would say, this is great, we got to tell the world about this. Your people are functioning so much better on this trading floor. Their private sector clients would say, hell no. You can't tell my competitors. I don't want the folks a floor below me understanding that my people are functioning at 300%. Their brains are working 300% better than, than my people. Um, so really going to a vaunted, respected public institution, United Technologies felt was the only way they could uh, get this data out into the marketplace. This research suggests that the health and productivity benefits far outweigh energy costs and environmental impacts and can be mitigated through a variety of readily available strategies. We have been presented with the false choice of energy efficiency or healthy buildings for too long. Healthy indoor environments for too long, we can and must have both. This is the director of the Chan School of Public Health study. So uh, another bright point of light, Architecture 2030. Uh, a worldwide movement, some very smart folks said, you know, uh, we can and should, and you'll see why, build buildings that are carbon neutral by the year 2030. And why? Because our built environment is by itself the largest chunk of carbon emissions into our environment, into our atmosphere. Um, this is a growing body of knowledge, uh, this piece about embodied carbon. Uh, that number is going up. Uh, we learn more and more about life through life cycle analysis of building materials, what it costs to mine that material in terms of carbon, uh, what it costs to transport that material, get it to the job site. Um, that's all carbon that is in these buildings. And the more life cycle analysis we do, the smarter we get about how much embodied carbon. So this impacts precisely uh, largely concrete, steel, and aluminum in our buildings. So you'll see and hear folks talking about new mixes of concrete, uh, cement, apparently, I assumed cement was a mineral that was mined out of the ground and mixed into concrete. Uh, it's burnt or somehow treated with energy to make it into cement so it can be made into concrete. Uh, and it takes a lot of carbon to do so. So as we get better in our building operations and get more efficient, the impact of embodying carbon as a percentage of the problem is only gonna grow. Uh, in the U.S., uh, depending on the year, depending on the data source, well over 40%, the largest chunk of CO2 emissions are coming from our built environment. So Architecture 2030, uh, some very smart, smart folks said uh, most recently that today in 2018, we have 2.5 trillion square feet of global real estate, global floor area. By 2060, that's going to double. We're going to have 5 trillion square feet of real estate floor area. Um, so, we can either use that two and a half trillion square feet to make a dramatic impact on this situation, on the building sector's contribution to climate change, or not. Or we can not do this stuff, and let's see if we can hold 1.5 degrees Celsius. Do we really want to gamble and maybe get to two degrees Celsius? Uh, we will live in a much different planet um, if that is the case. A uh, different way of looking at the Architecture 2030 model. Basically, uh, let's start building more and more efficient, less carbon into our buildings and their operations to get to carbon neutral by 2030. Um, oh, 
in Minnesota, uh, we took that knowledge. Uh, Rick at LHB, the folks at the U of M Center for Sustainable Building Research, a lot of other smart folks uh, founded and created SB 2030, Minnesota Sustainable Buildings 2030. Uh, it is arguably more aggressive than Architecture 2030, and we can talk to you about that if need be. Um, and, and we'll come back to this at the end because we have been modeling our progress in Port Authority projects towards SB 2030. But again, hitting those targets in SB 2030 or Architecture 2030 are key to us moving the needle on the built environment's impact on climate change. So getting to why and when this moment is. Um, in the 1960s, it, the environmental movement was really about compliance. We were attacking point source pollution. Um, we had rivers starting on fire, uh, more uh, air emissions than you can imagine, uh, and it was about compliance. In the 1990s, we got a little smarter, uh, the eco-efficiency era, which was really about being less bad. Uh, let's, let's do things a little better. Um, in the, this decade, in the 2010s, uh, it could be argued that, particularly with consumer brands and uh, in the public marketplace, uh, corporations are expected to have a sustainability strategy, approach, protocol, something really to give them a license to operate in the public square um, without acknowledging your entity's impact on sustainability, on the environment, uh, that license to operate, your goodwill of the public for you to function as a business, that card could get yanked pretty quick. And we see examples of that fairly regularly. Um, over the next decade, um, you know, I asked, I think it was Doug and, and maybe even Rick in prepping for this event, um, is it already passe to talk about net zero? Uh, because really where we need to be is net positive. Um, and you'll see that integrated throughout the, the day here. Um, but we really do need to, and are starting to move towards building systems and infrastructure that can actually restore our, our, our ecosystem services that support life on this planet. So that's the big picture. And with that, hey, I'm gonna I've bring had... my uh, Dear friend and mentor uh, in all things sustainability, Rick Carter from LHB Architects. Thank you. Which one? <clears throat> yep. Okay. Well, I'll say two things about Monty's presentation. First of all, I was really happy I didn't have to follow Chris or Brandon or Doug, but I didn't know how hard it was going to be to follow Monty. <laughs> but he got to do all the kind of depressing stuff, and I'm going to be in the technical weeds, so it'll be a little easier from that. The other thing is Monty used twice a slide that I see a lot that takes the carbon and imagine it was probably U.S. carbon and divides it into these quadrants where the realization for me hit in probably the mid-90s that what I get up to do every day as an architect, um, if climate change is the biggest problem that faces the planet and our future generations, which I think it is, and I'm like half the problem, until I realized that most of industry, which is another quarter of the pie, actually happens in buildings, and the rest is transportation, and I work in a firm that does transportation. So I got 100% of it on my plate, and I'll try and do the best I can. So, so I'm gonna dig into the weeds. We were, um, uh, we were honored to be able to work with the Port Authority to help meet their strategic goal of having a net zero building, and um, started out with the notion that Monty wanted to know the most cost-effective way to do a net zero building. I mean, as we'll talk about, we've had net zero buildings for a long time. And, and I'll say net positive, if it's one KBTU producing more than it's using, it's net positive. So net positive, net zero, definitely can do it, but what's the cost-effective way? Which obviously is the big question, otherwise they'd be all over the place, right? So, um, Stacy Demmer, who couldn't be here today and helped prepare all these slides, would say the definition for her when we first started out was a building, and I don't normally read the slides, but I'm going to do this one, a building which balances energy used with energy produced through on-site renewables. Sounds simple. Um, until you realize that every organization, including USGBC, has their own definition of net zero, that varies, and many organizations have multiple definitions of net zero that vary on um, nuances such as the energy boundary, the time border, et cetera. So for today, if you will, we're gonna say a building with greatly reduced energy loads 
such that the total site consumption from, of energy from all sources has been fully balanced by on-site renewable generation, okay? So whenever I say net zero or net positive for the rest of the 20 minutes, that's what I mean. Um, this is a little bit of a context, so we changed this slide. Uh, we, Stacy added 2019 this time. So in terms of truly, so keep in mind now, a building has to operate for at least a year to meet that definition, right? So if you've designed a building to be net zero and you've been operating it for six months and it looks good, it's not net zero. It has to be operating and proven to produce as much energy as it uses for over a year. So there are approximately 81 of those in the United States today. Fast on its heels, almost 500 trying to be. And if you look real close in Minnesota, you can see several blue dots. I know um, Wolf Ridge has a nearly net zero building. The city of St. Louis Park is planning a net zero building. But if you look really close, there's one green dot. Does anybody know the one commercial green or net zero building in Minnesota? Take a guess. Okay. Um, if you go to the science museum in the summertime and you walk in the backyard and play miniature golf, you go into a little building called the Science House, which is kind of like a house. It's about 2,100 square feet. It was designed by Barbara Latticeur and the White Group 20 years ago, 22 years ago. Um, the first year, it's geothermal heating and cooling, has very low loads. It's one level building. It has a small wind turbine and a lot of PV and they tweaked it after the first year, added some PV and it's been operating as a net zero commercial building ever since. That's the only building in Minnesota that is net zero. So Monty wants to be number two. How am I doing? Okay, good. Um, just a little bit more information about that, just a spread of where those buildings are coming from. The way this chart is divided up, most of the People having done actual net zero buildings are the kind of building we're talking about today, which I thought was interesting, a for-profit private institution. You can see the way they're split up. Um, if you added public buildings together or nonprofits, they'd probably be greater, with county being number two. And by the way, we just finished a very similar project for Hennepin County um, for a library that they plan to do net zero, and we did a very similar exercise with them. So now I'm going to dig into the details and ju jump in anytime if you think. I, uh, I wasn't checking you on okay. time. No, my, no. My phone yeah. was ringing on my wrist for something. <laughs> okay, all right. Um, so I'm going to use this terminology and just come along with me if you're not used to it. KBTU per square foot per year. And that's energy use intensity. So think about it like miles per gallon, except you want it to be lower instead of higher. Okay? So zero KBTU per square foot per year is a net zero building. KBTU is a metric that I can take anything, kilowatts of electricity, therms of gas, pounds of steam, cords of wood, and convert into one metric, um, normalize it by area, square foot, and time, year. So you'll kind of get a sense of where those numbers are by the time we get through this. The national average for the building we're talking about today is about 32, and the Midwest average not unexpectedly, and you can see the heating flow difference is about 47. So that's what we're starting with when we're trying to get to zero. A little bit about the process. We use the term integrated or integrative. It's a little easier for me to tell you what it's not. If you've worked on a project where an architect and an owner establish a form, a structural engineer tells you how to make it stand up, a mechanical electrical engineer will light it, cool it, and heat it, Eventually, someone comes along with finishes, someone comes along to operate it and then occupy it. That's a linear process that will never get us where we need to get to without having to spend a ton of money on photovoltaics. So we do a very iterative process. In the very beginning, we've got the developer, we've got the contractor. In our case, RJ Ryan helped us immensely. We've got building operators, building owners, all the design disciplines. Uh, we can't afford to have everybody in the room at every meeting through the whole project, but we loop back again and again through the process, and that's what the diagram on top is. So in terms of the typology, you know, this, I think, doesn't need much of a presentation to this group. Monty talked about why they picked 60,000 square feet, pretty conventional base size, clear height. He wanted it to be an 80-20 office warehouse use. 
Typically, that's a slab on grade building with precast walls and a structural steel roof. Where we started was we took that prototype building and did some early energy modeling. So if you're not familiar with energy modeling, before we build a building today, we can build it in the computer and know exactly how much energy it's going to use. If we build it exactly the way we predict and operate it exactly the way we predict, which we never do, but we can be pretty close. The problem is most of the time what we do is we do energy modeling on a building where we've already made most of the decisions that are going to affect the energy use. We come up with a form, we orient it on a site, we have the major envelope systems, major mechanical systems, and we spend a lot of time deciding which lights to put in it, which controls to use, et cetera. Um, in this case, we do the modeling before we even have a sketch. We're literally modeling an idea. And we're able to rank order um, impacts of EUI um, based on the impact on that building type. And then we can isolate them and find a sweet spot in terms of what the cost of the improvement is versus the saving. A little bit about the 110-100 rule that Monty talked about. And I, we just kind of stuck this in the middle to say, don't forget about occupant health. If we save the owner a dollar or two a square foot on energy and cost them $10 a square foot for people, we've blown it. It'll never work. So we have to do all the things Monty talked about in terms of limiting the VOCs, increasing the ventilation, et cetera. What's really good about this, though, is there are a lot of things where you're not even making a choice. You're not making a compromise. We do... As much as possible, we do uh, natural daylight, which is good for the occupant. Probably in that same test, we'd see similar results, and it reduces the energy consumption. So we have to prioritize, but that's a constant. We're always thinking about the occupant self. A little bit about on-site production. So I said in the beginning, we're, we're, we're not going to be able to, we'll never, I don't think, be able to make an, a building not use energy. So we have to produce as much as we can in the urban environment in the Midwest. Photovoltaics is the best way. We can't quite do wind at this scale yet. So we just did a quick exercise. If we took that building 60,000 square feet and covered it with photovoltaics, lo and behold, if we just want to throw millions of dollars at this building, we don't have to do any special design. We can get the, the Midwest average building of 47 kBTU, we can produce it on this building. And we know that's not feasible from a cost standpoint, so we work our way down. And we ended up, um, and we eventually end up at this exact point you'll see, with less than a third of the roof, producing about 14 kBTU per square foot per year, which is where we thought about where we'd be from our early modeling. Rick, I, yeah. I will hop in there real quick, yeah. um, because I know we've got folks from IPS Solar in the room, um, and our Port Authority staff certainly knows that last week, uh, our credit committee approved a financing of a 1.35 megawatt rooftop solar system uh, at one of our headquarters buildings that was just completed this year. Um, they're a very high energy user, so a lot of that goes to offset their process load, uh, which, according to the owner, was probably reaching well over $2 a square foot, $2.50 a square foot uh, in energy, which is a big number for an industrial building. Um, any other user that would move into that building uh, with that 1.35 megawatts would certainly be net zero, net positive electricity uh, and still have to calculate or deal with their gas load. But um, it made sense for them to maximize the rooftop, whereas here we're playing this balancing act uh, to get uh, to a place where we're still relatively agnostic in this model to process load. I just put PV on my roof at home and I had limited um, right size orientation and money and a wife who thought it was crazy. So I, I certainly don't produce as much as I use. But I also just bought an electric car, so I would like to say I'm driving carbon free, as long as I can assume that power is going right into that outlet. Um, a little bit about once the design team and the construction team are finished, and we've seen this again and again, we can design a building that can be net zero and we can build it and we can turn it over to the owner. And unless we have a very significant overlap back to that chart, it's not gonna happen. So we need a transition plan to hand off to the building operators, to the owner and the occupants. 
we always say, and this is at the top of my list, a commissioning agent. You need a person whose job it isn't to design the building, to build the building, to design the mechanical system, test and balance. Their whole job is to make sure that the mechanical electrical system operates the way it was intended to. You can commission the envelope and other parts of the building too, but it's usually the mechanical electrical system that are most important. And then, and this isn't just a plug because I'm an architect, if you wanna do this, you have to extend the engagement of the design team to overlap with that commissioning agent's um, uh, on-site work and the owner's first year of operations because things aren't gonna go right. It's gonna take six months or a year to get things that finely tuned and you need to have that whole team on board. And then you have to track. So Monty knows um, going back to about 2008, we measure everything. It's like I've been accused of worried more about measuring than actually getting it right in the first place, which I don't think is exactly true. But if you don't know what's actually happening in the building, it doesn't really matter how good your intentions were or what your list of improvements were or how close you think your energy model is. So the dials on the right are out of the B3 system, which is part um, sort of a accompaniment to the SB 2030 system for the state of Minnesota. So any building that's in there, including we have many of our private buildings in there, most of the public buildings for the state of Minnesota are in there and several of the Port Authority buildings are in there. We see at least on a monthly basis, all the energy used by utility in BTUs, dollars and carbon. And those are all different and we can talk about that maybe if there's time for q and I'm not certainly gonna go through it now. But what I say to everybody who wants to have an energy efficient building is you have to design it right, you have to have the strategies, you have to build it and operate it correctly, you have to track it, and then someone has to fall in love with this data. Someone has to say, I can't wait until the October bill shows up in that tracking system so I can go look and see if it's still operating the way it should be, and then decide what to do if it's not. What's the problem? What's the adaptation? And you know, today in our office, we have everything metered. I know exactly if the energy varies, whether it comes from the lighting on this side of the office or that side of the office or the server room or someone's desk. In the case of a building where I've got a electric meter and a gas meter and I've got seasonal differences, I can narrow it down pretty close if I'm a, a good building operator. Uh, a quick case study, just again to show that, that this isn't pie in the sky. So I, I'm, Gonna not, I'm not going to say it's easy, but it's relatively easy to make a single level low energy use building net zero. It's hard to make a five story energy intensive building net zero. And this organization, it's the USGBC Pacific Northwest chapter, the living, uh, the Institute for um, the Living Building Challenge organization, a few others built this building a number of years ago. It's called the Bullet Center. As you can see, it's five stories with a full basement. And in terms of those numbers, that 92 EUI for a typical office building, I say in Minnesota, it's around 100 to 110. So they're trying to go from 100 to zero. So you can see one of the things they did very creatively is built a very large overhanging roof so they could maximize the um, PV, but that's not the answer. The answer is they got the EUI down to 16. And I've toured that building and they did everything. They did geothermal heating and cooling systems, LED lighting, controls, very active approach to managing the users in terms of plug load. And one thing I'll point out, you don't have to necessarily do the math here because I've done it and I, I might have come up with the 31.4 at one point, but I think it's a little more than that. In the average office building in Minnesota today, the things that we plug in, not heating, not lighting, not cooling, the things that we plug in use 20% of the energy in a building, 20%. So in this case, they've reduced the other 80% significantly. When they get down to 16, I would say over a third, almost 40% of what's happening in that building now to consume energy is plug load. So now it's really all on the occupants of the building to manage the state of that level. So that's where you have to really have everybody on board. Um, a little bit more about this specific design. So a, a bit more about numbers, um, really in the weeds, but Monty teed it up really well. So in Minnesota, if 
the state gave general obligation bonds to somebody like the Port Authority to build an office warehouse building, they'd be required by law to establish a benchmark using an online system and build, design, and operate the building to be 80% less than that. So we ran this building through those numbers just for kicks. The benchmark we came up with was 60, which is relatively high, but that's okay because we're trying to kind of bring people in. But the target is 18. So we're saying, by law, this building needs to be at 18, hypothetically. The Midwest average I talked about before is 47. We also calculated, and we sat down and said, Monty, Jeremy, um, what would we build today? Which we basically just did at Midway with Brandon and um, the, the UP Port Authority project. What would we build today? And we modeled that to be 36. So we're already actually quite a bit better than a baseline or a code or a Midwest average. But where we decided we needed to get to, partly because of the production and the affordability of the PV, partly because we knew we could, was 14. So we left that exercise in the beginning saying 14 was our goal. Um, just a different way of looking at it. Again, we're running constant iterative energy models in um, architectural language. We're not even in schematic design. We're in pre-design. We're in concept design. So 36 is our baseline. If we just run optimized envelope, we get it down to 33. We optimize the mechanical system, we get down to 21. And if we throw everything else we can think of, we get down to 14, which is where we wanted to be. So it was quite a luxury to have a site um, agnostic project. Basically, Monty said, you make up the site. OK, I want a site with uh, where the um, doors are pointing to the south, and I can plant some winds to, or some trees to the northwest, and I can make the site any way I want. Not a big difference, but we can plug this, the site into the model. We can turn the building, change its shape, orientation, and we can see a difference up or down in EUI. Um, when I saw Ed Masria, who created SB 2030 speak um, 15 years ago, and I think he says this every time he talks, if as an architect, and we're close to this, from the very first concept sketch, that EUI number is in the lower right corner. And everything I do, all the way through concept, schematic, DD, CD, spec writing, value engineering, shop drawings, construction, every move anyone makes, that number goes up or down, we would all be designing that zero building. Problem is we make thousands of decisions constantly. We don't know the impact of our decisions, so it's going up and down. In terms of the form, we didn't change things very much in plan. We compacted the office, which gave us some advantages in terms of the mechanical systems and daylighting and efficiencies. The big move, and it's really not a really big move, is we raised or lo we actually lowered the roof structure over the primarily the office area and created a clear story all along the building facing north. So that single move did two things. We reduced the cubic feet of conditioned space that would otherwise be wasted above 20% of the office that doesn't need 24 foot clearance. And it brought natural light much farther into the space. Those were two big benefits from one pretty simple move that I can't remember what Jeremy said it would cost, but it wasn't very much money. So here you can see that in a little bit more graphic form. The office is to the right, the warehouse is to the left. And yes, there is a little bit of warehouse on each end of that office the way we lay the plan out, but most clients don't need 24 foot clear in every single square foot of their space. <clears throat> After that, again, we went through, even though we're in concept design, we went through every single detail of the building and thought about what we would do differently if we could to the convention. You know, the wall structures, um, most Precast manufacturers now make a variety of R values. That's new in the last five or 10 years, but we looked at other systems. Um, looking at the storefront assemblies, which aren't unique to warehouse buildings, and so we had a lot of options there. Things like the door seal and the dock levelers that are really weak points in a building like this, and there are lots of opportunities to improve the energy efficiency there. So we analyzed every one of those, plugged them into our model, Nice hand sketches, thinking about one of the biggest offenders in any building, particularly in a office warehouse building, are, are thermal bridging, places where we just really haven't thought about the fact that it's concrete all the way through, or there's steel against concrete, and really trying to make sure that 
super yellow insulation, even if it's not very thick, if it just exists in a place where we're not bridging through and letting the cold air in, it's a huge advantage that we can model. Um, lighting, again, we're maximizing. In today's world, we're using LEDs almost everywhere. But if we can not have them on because we've got daylight or we can scale them back using um, daylight controls or have them off in an area where people aren't, you know, the vast majority of lighting in any city is lights that are on when no one's using them, okay? You might find now you go into a stairway and the lights turn on. Before that happened, those lights were on 24-7, 365. A couple of unique things um, with uh, mechanical system, we use ground source heat pump and we've tweaked that with help from Jimmy from Darcy over the last couple of weeks to really refine it and get it as good as it can be. It really makes sense for a building like this. It's an all electric load. It gives us heating and cooling and at least 40 or 50% more efficient than any other way we're gonna do it. Um, the, the system of circulating heating and cooling air through an ETU in the warehouse. I'm not a mechanical engineer, so I probably couldn't even explain this if you asked me, but I know we've been doing it for a long time. We did a lead gold building that was the highest scoring building in Minnesota 15 years ago for quality bicycle products in Bloomington, and we used that same system, super efficient. Sometimes you don't have to have a new thing, a thing that's been around for a while works fine. Oops. Okay, so now into the net zero analysis. So again, I think by now you got it pretty well figured out. The baseline we're starting with is 36. The team was trying to come up with every way possible to get it down to 14. Uh, the way we ended up laying out the photovoltaics in the end, we ended up around 16. Maybe was, that was so we would be net positive. We have two KBTU per square foot advantage. Um, and uh, then it got into a little bit more of the weeds where we're now we're really looking at the cost effectiveness. You know, what's the what's the return on investment of making the wall as as good as it can be versus making the mechanical system as good as it can be? Where you can see one extreme is with PV, there's just a big investment, but in other areas we're trying to find that fine balance. And what Stacy and her team found was going with the additional R value in the wall was not making sense from a payback standpoint. So they backed that out of the equation that in the, at the beginning, we were at a maybe before photovoltaic somewhere in the neighborhood of a 12 to a $13 a square foot gap. And Monty was like, okay, not as bad as I thought, but could be better. Um, then we eliminated the, we eliminated the uh, improved walls that were costing us $5.28 a foot. And we brought it back down to about a $7 gap. So this is really what Monty wanted from us in the first place. If Brandon can build the conventional design for 63 bucks a square foot, approximately, and we want this building to be within at least a reasonable grasp of being able to afford the PV to put on the roof, we think that's gonna cost about seven bucks a square foot. And that's where Monty says, we think we can do that. That's manageable. I'll let him talk about that a little bit more. The um, PV system, again, with Jimmy's help, the, this is a tough number because photovoltaics, there's so many variables. They're more efficient every day, cost competitive, there's tax implications, rebates, financing options. I'm sure Monty will talk about that a little bit. But we think with relative comfort that this building for another five or six bucks a square foot can close that gap. So this was our final slide. <clears throat> Costs about $4 million to build the building and fit it out a little less than 10% of that to get it down from the kind of the baseline of 36 down to that very, very high performing 14 and another probably eight or 9% to close that gap and make it net zero with photovoltaic. So I'm gonna let you chime in and sure, hang um, around. Why don't you go back one slide, sure. Rick? Um, so this, let's call it seven bucks a square foot on a 60,000 square footer. Um, that feels like a digestible number. Um, we built, uh, we sold a piece of land, Opus built a 90,000 square footer. Um, over the course of the design and preparing to close that transaction, uh, we had two different issues come up of that scale. Uh, utility related issues, 
Uh, water main looping, do we have enough pressure for early suppression fast response fire system? No, what do we do? Someone's got to spend three, four hundred thousand dollars to solve that. We managed to solve that. Um, similar situation with stormwater. So uh, on this size and scale of a project, having that kind of a delta to accomplish a project goal, in this case net zero, uh, feels doable, feels digestible um, throughout the design financing developer driven model, um, we should be able to solve that problem and build one of these at net zero at 60,000 square feet. Um, Brandon doesn't want to build a 60,000 square footer. <laughs> he wants to build a 200,000 square footer uh, because he's got to be in the marketplace at, you know, Richard or I see the folks from Transwestern here are going to tell us, uh, you know, you guys need to be at five and 10 rents or 525 and 1025 rents. Uh, there's some magic there, and his cost per square foot, if he can take that down by building a larger building, uh, that works in a commodity-driven marketplace, such as industrial square footage, industrial product. Um, so, uh, you know, in talking with R.J. Ryan, who's probably the largest provider of this type of product in the marketplace, um, they felt like there's probably a 15% savings on the square foot cost if you scale this from a 60,000 square foot model to a 200,000 square foot model. So now you've got this $7 square foot number that you hack 15% off. Now you're really getting to something that is solvable. Um, we asked these folks to work on this at a 60,000 square foot scale. In our experience, um, that's our sweet spot for owner user uh, developments. And yes, it does seem like having an owner user at the table to build this building. Uh, who might see some brand benefit, some marketing benefit, some employee retention or productivity benefit, and might be willing to invest a little more to help us uh, solve that gap. Um, that seems to me like the most reasonable place to be. Um, I'm still pushing him to get there with us and, uh, and others out here in the crowd. That's why we built this, was to have these conversations, to invite you all into the conversation uh, and try and figure out a way to accomplish this goal for all the reasons I started the day with here. And of course, the one thing neither of us said is, what is version of Architecture 2030? Um, we've been modeling uh, our last several buildings against an SB 2030. What uh, those of you familiar with the modeling process that uh, for industrial projects that Excel takes you through energy design assistance, uh, bundles one, two, and three, we've basically now gone back and have asked them to add an SB 2030 compliant, even though our projects are generally not required to hit that target, we wanted to know how aggressive it was to hit that target. So call it bundle three prime, the SB 2030 bundle. And we went back uh, just in the last couple of weeks here and looked at how close did we get. Um, a lot of numbers there, uh, don't expect you to digest them all, been a lot of numbers thrown at you here. Um, but three of the four up there, we are pretty damn close. Um, and in our world, uh, this is a, the green design review process the Port Authority has had in place since 2003 is a mandatory process with negotiated outcomes. We largely sell subsidized land to entice businesses to bring their jobs to St. Paul. Um, and one of the many trade-offs uh, for that subsidized land is they get to sit down and get lectured by Rick and myself and a team of experts that work with their design team to really help them make informed decisions. Uh, but at the end of the day, they still get to make that decision. Uh, they choose bundle one, two, or three. Um, we show them the SB 2030 model uh, to try to get them there. Um, and we are getting closer and closer with every iteration of these type of buildings. Good afternoon, thank you very much. Quick question, uh, I've done a lot of research as well on the impact of buildings on human performance. Uh, are you familiar with the GSA study done in 2009 uh, regarding innovative workplace? Because they talk about employee turnover more so than anything else. And that dollar, in fact, I had gotten a deal with U.S. Bank if we could solve their $100 million a year turnover problem right. um, through the building environment. So I think that's a really fascinating one to look at. As well as I'm wondering how SB 2030 compares to the federal government ESI, EISA's 2007 document that wants these goals as well. So I'll take a crack at both. I don't, um, I'm familiar with a lot of the work that GSA has done. I, I can tell you in terms of 
of replacement and retention as an architect, whether we're working on a spec office building that's gonna be um, leased over time or working with an end user, their number one problem today by far is attracting and retaining talent. So we did a building for um, Brandon's company next door to us um, called the Nordic. The owner made a decision to use the well um, building system and put in operable windows for a couple of reasons, namely because they, they, their number one goal is to lease up the space and they felt that convincing potential tenants that it was a healthy space was the absolute first and most important thing to do. I don't know about the EIS comparison with SB 2030. Um, it, I, I always say, and we're pretty darn close to it now, so in 2020, next January, the state of Minnesota system will be a 90% reduction. So you'll be required to calculate a baseline and be 90%, and then five more years I won't have to do math anymore because zero is zero, right? You'll have to have in 2025, when you get $1 of general obligation funds in the state of Minnesota, a net zero building. Um, one point I forgot to make earlier. Rick, how many employees does LHB have in the state of Minnesota? 250. 250 people. Um, so you are a tenant and a business owner who takes these same considerations into account every day. Um, I asked Rick a really dumb question earlier this year at lunch. I said, Rick, you know, I'm just curious. Um, where do you sit within your firm? Rather large firm, doesn't do all this stuff. What, half of your work is municipal infrastructure type work? Yeah. Um, so I said, so where, where do you sit? Are you like out there on the fringe? Like that's Rick and his crazy green tree hugging ideological crap or you know, what, what's the story with your rather large established engineering architecture firm that's been around for how many years? 55. 55 years. Uh, he said, well, you know, it's not public yet, uh, but I'll tell you if you keep it under your hat. Um, now it's going to be public. <laughs> Go ahead. They, they, uh, they have named me CEO. Oh, that was that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, that really uh, was reassuring to me that this just isn't, you know, he and I just an echo chamber of, you know, green design. Um, but it, it really, uh, I think, is a, a statement to your commitment to this work and your firm's commitment to this work. And you guys have been a great partner over the years. I wanted to thank you for that. Uh, Jimmy, Jimmy Randolph here. Jimmy, raise your hand. Uh, Jimmy uh, is with Darcy Solutions. Um, we, I got to know Jimmy uh, through our church and uh, realized he was a research scientist at the University of Minnesota uh, and has recently spun out uh, geotherm technology. I would venture to say sort of next generation geothermal technologies, uh, patented proprietary type stuff that uh, was baked into this model and is going to help us achieve these goals moving forward. So if you're interested in geotherm, I suggest you talk to Jimmy and understand what Darcy Solutions has, uh, has dreamt up here. Um, and with that, I think okay. we're done. All right. Um, and we're going to ask Brandon Champeau from United Properties to come. Uh, thanks, Monty and Rick. Uh, so my name is Brandon Champeau. I'm a senior vice president at United Properties. And I've had the luxury of working with Monty and the LHB team um, and the Port Authority team on um, a really exciting project that we undertook about five years ago and um, are, are close to kind of closing closing the uh, final chapter of it out, but it's, it's timely in the discussion today. And I'll get to that in a second, but before I get started, I, I'm just curious how many people in the room are uh, like architects or engineers? How many are real estate brokers or developers? I don't know what everybody else is. It's the only people I know in the world. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, I'm 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 going to admit that uh, a lot of a lot of my deck here is to um, is is really pointed towards the people on the front lines. I would say the real estate brokers and the real estate directors of various companies, because as we were grappling with this project, that was our biggest concern: is whether we could sell. Um, all of the positive effects of a 
um, highly sustainable building to the market? Could we get could we get the tenants to recognize the value? Could we get the brokers to recognize the value? And um, and it was it was challenging, and I'll get into some of that here in a second. But uh, so so a lot of what I'm going to talk about is is uh, geared towards the um, I would say more of the the business and kind of um, deal maker audience. So uh, with that. I'm a big movie quoting person, so um, if anybody's ever seen the movie Wall Street from the 80s, it's one of the best, uh, the best like financial person movies of all time. But uh, Gordon Gecko, who uh, is played by Michael Douglas, has a quote at one point in it that is uh, talks about greed. So I wanted to have a little play on that here to begin today's presentation, and uh, instead of using the word greed, I'm using the word green. Uh, but rather than saying net zero, which is what we're talking about right now, uh, I use the word green because, quite frankly, like getting a lot of the frontline real estate people to even just think about green as a strategy is hard enough, let alone the discussion about net zero. And, um, and we'll talk about that a little bit more here in a second. But uh, so, you know, when I'm talking to real estate professionals, uh, a lot of times, you know, we try to start with like, why should we care? And I know we got into some of the why already, but I kind of feel like the people I deal with, um, I have a lot of, I'm, I make, I'm going to like make fun of um, a lot of real estate brokers and developers because I feel like we're a lot of the same. But uh, um, and since I thought there was going to be more brokers in the room, we'll just laugh at them instead of laughing, <laughs> <laughs> laughing with them here. But I also was a broker at one time, so. I'm allowed to do that, but I, I, I kind of feel like there's like three perspectives that they bring. Either either they kind of bring the scientist perspective, where they just believe the facts and um, and and just believe what a lot of really smart people tell us. Uh, there's there's a few, but very very little. I would say activist personalities in the uh, with a lot of people that I deal with, uh, and then there's a lot of what I would say uh, pretenders who. Uh, pretend like they care about a lot of this stuff, but think most of it's BS. And, um, and I think that, uh, you know, it's, it, it really depends on the filter of what you're kind of viewing that through. But, you know, when we're talking about the economics of a deal and everything, uh, talking about sustainability and some of this stuff is, is uh, it, it, it's difficult with, with certain audiences to get them to recognize the overall value. Uh, but when we started down this path uh, a few years ago, we really wanted to be a market leader in doing something highly sustainable um, in the city, especially with industrial. We, our, our perspective was that the market was getting there in the industrial sector um, the way that it was getting there and, or had already kind of gone mainstream in, in office buildings and some other uh, structures. But uh, for for me, and this was really, this was in 2018 actually that I read this, uh, this was where I started to recognize that even though we might have been a couple of years ahead, I would say, in what we were trying to do with the Midway project, uh, I believe that a lot of companies are going to start to recognize that this is something that we, especially as investors in the built environment, have to accelerate our thinking on. And I don't know if anybody has, uh, or I've heard, I'm sure most of you heard of the company BlackRock. They're a $6.8 trillion company. They manage $6.8 trillion worth of assets. And um, they have a reputation since they started in the late 80s of being highly um, profit focused and cutthroat. And this was actually in their CEO letter in 2018 from from Larry Fink, uh, their CEO, and, and this part that I read here, indeed the public expectations of your company have never been greater. Society is demanding that companies, both public and private, serve a social purpose. To prosper over time, every company must not only deliver financial performance, but also show how it makes a positive contribution to society. And that statement coming from Larry Fink, I think was really game changing because uh, the fact that he is representing $6.8 trillion worth of assets uh, their company is not in a position where they're dictating to their clients what they want them to do. They're listening to their clients and what they what their clients are expecting. And so, for him to make that statement, I thought, uh, you know, and again, this was only about two years ago. Now, 
was um, indicative of maybe an inflection point in the you know in the investor world and what we have to try to do to try to accelerate some of these solutions so that we don't face the doom and gloom that that Monty talked about. Um, and you know from a from a real estate um, perspective, what what I've been trying to explain for a few years as we've gone through this process is that um, this is this sustainability stuff is not a fad. It's um, it's not going to get easier. And as you know, us as real estate professionals have, I guess, you know, two choices to make. We can we can either kind of wait for the regulations to kick in, or uh, wait for the cities to tell us what we're going to have to do. Um, or we can we can start to make moves uh, on our own, and, and and that's really where United Properties has been for the last couple of years. We, and and I'm thankful of the process that we've been going through on this project that, that we'll get to in a second. Uh, but because it it has prepared us, I believe, for a lot of the discussions that are now starting to come from the cities, and um, and from some of the people that are dictating the rules of development. Uh, the Minneapolis 2040 plan was a great example of that. Uh, there were uh, 14 goals, I think, in the plan, or 13 goals. Four out of uh, out of the 13 uh, were attributed to you know, climate sustainability or resiliency. Uh, there were about 100 policies that they had proposed in the plan, and it was about 25 out of the 100 policies could be attributed to a uh, you know, to the same climate sustainability or resiliency. And so I think that um, you know it's this is a stuff that we've been living through this project for the last few years and has gotten us more comfortable with speaking some of this language and I'm I'm thankful of that because I do think that this is something that is going to become the norm and some of the the uh, requirements that are going to be imposed on the building environment whether it's the design construction or investment are going to get worse however you want to define worse um, but. There are a couple things that are starting to happen positively, and uh, how many here in the room have heard of the e an ESG score? Okay, so uh, the environmental, social, and governance score of a company, and Monty, I think you touched on this just a second ago, but um, or uh, maybe Ricky touched on it about um, the the impact that companies have if we can't quickly quantify our environmental, social, and governance impact on the world, um, even though it's dealing with three kind of non-financial metrics, that's quickly going to become a financial problem for a lot of these companies. And uh, in the real estate industry, an organization called Gresby, which has been around, I believe, since 2012, um, has created a metric system to help real estate companies identify what that impact is and we are it's it hasn't come to Minnesota yet as far as I know maybe actually we were just talking last night about maybe one case study but um, we do hear about this from some of the firms that we work with that operate in Europe and then operate in, in Asia in that um, certain companies that don't meet a threshold score a, thresh, a threshold ESG score actually don't receive like an RFP for a job or don't um, aren't invited to the party basically and so again, even though you know we're trying to measure a non-financial impact, it is going to start impacting a lot of these real estate companies financially. And when I said that we're, you know, as an industry, are trying to catch up, I try to fit as every single logo that I could on these next two slides. But uh, this is this is every real estate firm that is currently a member of um, or has registered projects through the Gresby system. I know this is really small, but I mean, it is virtually every uh, major brokerage firm. It's um, every major development firm, you know, global development firms. Um, I would say probably 80% of the people on here are the capital players, which are the ones that are bringing money to the project. And as most of us know, whoever brings the money typically dictates the rules. Um, but it's it you know to me this is telling that that if all of these companies are starting to recognize this, and again. It, in a lot of cases, it might be either a, year, a European subsidiary or a, you know, Asian subsidiary, but there are um, some North American companies here. Um, it tells me that that we're starting to kind of get it, and so uh, I think that's you know that's important because 
if we don't, um, well, yeah, the doom and gloom is going to happen, like we just said. So, uh, just a couple more stats from Gresby. I mean, 903 entities, and that's more a lot more than just the entities that I just showed, uh, because there's real estate management companies and others that, that aren't on there. Uh, but 64 countries, 79,000 assets, um, and 3.5 trillion dollars of of asset value have now been registered into the Gresby system, and so are now being tracked on their environmental, social, and governance score. And and obviously, um, companies are being monitored on that. They have to they have to publish these results yearly. So if they show themselves going up or down, it it you know impacts the perception of what they're doing as a business. Oh, I kind of repeated this uh, already, but I found this with this screenshot in corporateboardmember.com uh, or whatever. Um, but a company's ESG score will increasingly determine if trillions in global institutional and retail capital will flow toward them or away from them. And so I think as we start to think about how we sell this at an asset level, it, it really starts with, with uh, getting the leadership of the different companies and others to recognize the importance of thinking this way and the importance of, of how they're valuing their, cor their corporate social uh, responsibility. So, my point. My point is we can either lead or we can follow. This is the only image I could find between leader and follower online. Um, or like queen and pawns, I guess, but, or king and pawns. But, um, but um, and, and you know, I think for us at United Properties and, and the goal that we set out with the port, uh, like I said, five years ago, it was really to be the, the king here. Um, we, we recognized in the industrial sector in particular that there were no, um, there was not a lot of discussion around sustainability. There wasn't a lot of, uh, I would say, interest in exploring what we could do from a sustainable perspective in developing these buildings. And we, this was a conversation that we were having a lot more with our office clients. And so our theory when we got into this project was that uh, industrial was kind of ready, that, that you know, we might be cutting edge a little bit, um, but we should, we should set out and try to do something different in our market. And when we started talking to the port in late 2014, we identified this site. We, we initially set a goal to become the greenest, most sustainable industrial, or to create the most green and sustainable industrial building in the state. I'll tell you in a second if we actually got there. Um, but we, we had identified uh, the former St. Paul Saints Stadium site, which any of you here um, are potentially familiar with. Um, a site in the Midway area, right off of 280, uh, right between 280 and Snelling, and a second. Uh, <clears throat> this site was important for us for a couple of reasons. One, uh, it was an urban industrial site, which is kind of a rare find in the world today. Most of these types of buildings don't, you know, there aren't, there isn't a lot of large. Um, rectangular plots of land available close to the city. So from a market perspective, we were really excited about uh, the opportunity to do something here. And from a corporate perspective, uh, it, was, it was even more exciting for us because United Properties started in 1916 as the real estate manager for the Ham Brewery family. And while we hadn't done a lot of work in St. Paul over the last 100 years, um, we, we thought it would be really cool in our, you know, to try to time a project with our 100 year anniversary in the city and try to do something, you know, game changing and, and high profile. And so, so for us, this, you know, the site was kind of a rare find and then the opportunity to kind of up the ante on what we wanted to do here uh, was, was important to us and, and this was a, a, the perfect opportunity to do that. And I mentioned from, you know, kind of the market perspective, uh, the industrial world over the last six or seven years has changed dramatically. Um, it used to be much earlier than six or seven years ago. You know, the word industrial was always associated with smokestacks and you know, 
smog and whatever else. Um, but industrial today is high tech manufacturing, you know, med tech. Uh, from a distribution perspective, it's last mile delivery, getting as close to the customers as possible. And so we, we saw a number of different routes that we thought that this project could go and it kind of checked all those boxes uh, just from a pure location perspective. And the fact that, um, as I mentioned earlier, we felt like industrial was kind of ready to be future focused. Um, you know, this, this presented a perfect opportunity to start to, to head down this path of trying to create the greenest industrial building in the state. And um, that is the path that we headed down. <laughs> but before, uh, before we could get there, and Monty can probably give a lot more intel on this because it's highly technical, but uh, um, the St. Paul St. Stadium site, if anybody is familiar with it, was the old dumping grounds for the state fair. So um, there were, am I allowed to swear on a? Sure. Okay. I don't know if they have to take away some of these credits or something. <laughs> uh, but there were 20 pounds of shit, literally, or not 20 pounds, 20 feet of shit literally below uh, much of this site, and in some cases, I think even more than that. Um, and I didn't know this until I got on this project, but when you bury shit, it turns into methane over time. And you don't want to be standing around somebody who's lighting a match or smoking a cigarette when there's methane nearby it. Uh, and so before we could even get started talking about innovation and sustainability and what was possible with this project, Monty had to clean out a bunch of shit first. Yes. Uh, in addition to a lot of other stuff that I don't know if it's worth mentioning right now. But um, um, but it, it was a very challenging site just from an engineering perspective because of that, you know, the environmental cleanup that was required, the um, you know lack of, I would say, suitable soil and the soil corrections. We had to really rethink just the basic box of the project from an engineering perspective and how to make just the basic rectangle uh, feasible. And the way we got there, and again, I'm, I'm a financial person, so I'm not even gonna try to talk about the technical stuff. Maybe you guys can mention, mention it. Um, we did have to create two different foundation systems for the building uh, because there were certain parts of the project that we just couldn't, it was just too much stuff to try to pull out of the site. And, yes. uh, and it was just not cost effective. So we started looking at other foundation systems that you know could still maintain structural integrity, but that, that scared us um, because industrial buildings rely on a very solid uh, floor. When you're running um, forklifts over it all day long and you're stacking a lot of things, oftentimes very high, um, you can't have the floor moving in any direction. And so, uh, you know, that was something just, you know, Again, purely from an engineering perspective and the base building design that we had to get comfortable with um, were, were some of the engineering things that we had to do here. But but we did get there and um, we were able to, or really Monty and the Port Authority were able to um, get, the, get the site cleaned up to a state that was developable for us and structurally sufficient for us so that we could start going to work on some of the more fun and exciting uh, parts of industrial. I don't know if any of you are in industrial, but uh, this is like a gorgeous industrial picture. <laughs> like, there isn't a lot of stuff to get excited about in our world. They're big rectangular <laughs> buildings, but when you see one that's as bright as that and has like such large column spacing and high clear heights, uh, it doesn't get any better than that. And that's the truth. Um, but we really, uh, we, we did feel like, you know, we had a lot to live up to with with this location, the fact that it was right in the middle of the city and kind of offered something different than you know what is typically available for a company. So we really wanted to make sure that every part of what we did here was, was as perfect as possible. And um, again, the rectangles, you don't have to do a whole lot to make them um, really nice. But but um, in this case, you know, just the basic specs of, I don't know if anybody can see it, but what we're showing here with the LED lighting very efficient column spacing, 24 foot clear height, a lot of glass uh, is a, a, a very nice spec for somebody to start from. And we also, um, 
again, given the location, wanted to do something better than just traditional when it came to design. Uh, when I started doing industrial seven years ago, they actually at the company, they had to talk me into doing it because prior to that, I was doing office projects and medical and um, some retail and they said, well, we want you to run industrial now. And I was like, that's way too boring. I don't want to build like big rectangular boxes out in the suburbs. You can't really get fun with design. You know, it's not like doing something on Maine and Maine, but uh, what I have come to appreciate in working in this line of business for seven years now is the beauty that happens inside these buildings and um, how cool it is, you know, to learn companies' manufacturing processes and to understand how they get, you know, the goods from whatever, the inputs and the outputs. Uh, and so we often spend a lot more time with our clients focused on process and everything that's happening within the box and less time on what's, you know, happening outside the box. And quite frankly, a lot of companies could care less how much gingerbread you put on a building. They just want something efficient inside that they can make their widgets in faster and um, cheaper. But in this case, uh, we did we did feel like this, this site um, had more to live up to. And so we wanted something more interesting and um, I would give a ton of credit or all the credit here to the LHB team for pushing us in on different things. The only thing I would take credit for is this, I don't even know the name of the product, but this gorgeous brown thing. Uh, fake, fake wood. The fake wood product that I had seen in a book I was reading that had a picture of this apartment building in Europe. And I was like, that looks really pretty. And then brought it to LHB's office and said, like, can we do something like this? And they found a product that worked. Um, but, you know, we did uh, multiple multiple brick designs, um, a, a different type of scoring pattern on the precast. These buildings are typically just built with precast walls, but oftentimes it's just a big blank wall that we splash some paint on or uh, make it look kind of gritty or whatever. But in this case, uh, LHB pushed us to think about, you know, kind of an interesting pattern, which also was scary to me because I thought, what if the pattern doesn't like line up right? And, like, it's like if we screw one of these things up, it could get really, really fast. But um, I don't know if anybody can see it in the room, but uh, so what I'm talking about is just kind of this, this scoring pattern that we did throughout the building. And it, and it does look really, really nice. And so, um, you know, we were, you know, each step of the way here, we were investing, I would say, more than typical and more than traditional, which again, from a financial perspective, is a little scary. Um, the land itself was, at the time we acquired the land or bought into the partnership with the port, it was the high watermark for land prices for industrial in the city. And I'll show some of these numbers in a second, but uh, you know, we're already starting with expensive land, we're tacking on more expensive design, and then we started talking about some of the sustainability elements and what was possible. And I'll admit, um, it was a goal of ours, I'm not speaking about me personally right now, it was a goal to go down the sustainability path from the very beginning, but, um, but it was scary from a cost perspective as we were going through this because we, we didn't know if companies and you know, the people that we needed to try to sell this building to would, would value it. And so uh, we had you know, really set, I think it was early 2015 maybe, that we really got focused on what was possible from a sustainable perspective. And we went through the pre-certification process and landed kind of right in the middle of silver, which was really exciting because for one, uh, we, there was not a silver, lead silver industrial building in the state at the time. So we were already on the path to being um, the most sustainable. Uh, and it was also exciting in that um, you just don't get the opportunity to even get like a certified, lead certified plaque in industrial oftentimes because of the location of these buildings. When we're building them out in the suburbs, you don't really have access to transit a lot of the times. That makes you know, transportation, cost of transportation and access to more efficient um, ways of transportation makes a big difference in how it gets scored. So um, because we had the urban location here, we were able to start from a, you know, a pretty high foundation on the scoring system. And then as we kept going through each component and re, you know, related to the construction, and the design, it got a little more exciting and we, we landed right in the middle. Like I said, um, we identified 55 points that were possible and to be silver, you needed to be between 50 and 59. And um, I had no idea what we were doing as we were going through this process. Um, I was relying 
completely on these two right here and their teams to explain all of this to us because um, in what I recognize quickly is once you're in on this, you have to be all in because if you don't, if you don't fight for every single point and make sure that every step of the way you're getting the tenants to also do everything, it's, it's worthless. You can identify that you had 55 potential points. If you don't actually execute on it, you'll spend a lot of time and a lot of money up to that point and it won't, you won't end up getting your cool plaque at the end of the day. Um, but lead silver for us was was a really exciting opportunity. And so some of the things here, and again, I'm not technical, so I'm gonna talk about innovation in very layman's terms, but uh, it was a lot of highly integrated and coordinated design between the mechanical, electrical, and plumbing, which is not something you typically have to do in industrial. We typically build a box, tell the tenant how much we're gonna give them for a tenant improvement allowance, and then we don't really care what they do with it, who they use. Um, but in this case, we had to care about all of that and we had to make sure that it was all being monitored and coordinated um, correctly. Am I supposed to be done? Five minutes? Okay. Um, energy optimization, rooftop um, solar panels. I, I mentioned the trusted consultants. The other big component of this was really the lead contingency. So I was, I was extremely worried that we would get any tenants to buy into this. And so we... Um, we added an additional lead contingency allowance in our numbers um, to make sure that we could help them pay for pay the way on some of this stuff. Um, and that turned out to be a wise move because we did have to help them pay. So really quick, getting into a couple of these numbers here. Um, the traditional midway building would have cost, you know, this is just, if I was just building a, a regular industrial building with no upgrade design, no upgrade lead stuff, would have cost about $98 a foot, um, which is an expensive industrial building, or it was at the time. Um, when we started when we started adding in the sustainable elements, it added about another $6 a foot, and this is on a this is on 189,000 square foot building. I thought there was gonna be a lot of brokers and others in the room, so I didn't wanna make it like painfully obvious how much money we were spending and making. I wanted them to have to do the calculations themselves. But, um, but the building itself cost about 19.6, uh, million all in land design construction and that meant at the time that we were going to need a rent of about 781 a square foot which is very high in the market and I would say about 50 to 75 cents higher than what we thought the market was willing to pay and so for us to actually make money on this we were going to have to sell this thing at about 120 dollars a foot which also at the time had never been accomplished in the market so we really needed three things to happen we needed the brokers to sell you know, the overall value of this, we needed the tenants to be willing to pay a little bit more in exchange for the utility savings and the healthier employees and others. And we needed the investors to value the building as a you know, kind of future-proof facility. Um, so we convinced ourselves by repeating these statements over and over. Tenants will pay more for green. Brokers are smart enough to convince their clients. Um, sustainable equals healthy, happier employees. We need to lower your occupancy costs. You'll get positive PR. Doesn't everyone care about the environment? This is how it actually, all the old statements actually played out. Um, why can't you just lower your net rent? Um, we're not sure why they're spelling lead with two E's. Uh, we don't care about healthier, health, healthier employees. That's HR's problem. I'm in real estate. Utilities, that's facilities management. Um, PR, the company doesn't even have a marketing department. Um, can't we just cut this lead BS out? No one gets it. Um, so that's what it was like on the front line. And what did we end up learning as we went through this process? Um, we had to really educate every single person we dealt with. It started with the broker, to the real estate director, to the CFO, because every single step of the way, they would question why we were asking for certain things in the lease, why we were asking them to pay a little bit more for elements that they didn't have to pay more for in any other building. And it made it, um, it made it difficult because when we convinced one person, we had to rely on them to go upstream and sell it. And then when they didn't sell it, we had to get on a big conference call and try to sell the person. And then we thought we'd have it and then they would change their mind. Um, but it, it was, it was, you know, really the education piece was difficult. And um, it's the, the cost of occupancy and all the other things that we're talking about, the 110, 100 rule and all these, I'm still dumbfounded how we in the real estate industry cannot, cannot like, sell this in a coordinated way like sell how a little bit of extra stuff up front on the building can have a 10 times impact on other elements 
Um, and I, you know, I attribute it to just the siloed nature that a lot of us work in the different departments, but I do feel like if we can figure that out, it'll make this stuff a lot easier. Um, and, and, you know, we did, we did get one tenant in particular, Community Brothers, our first tenant, they, they were sold immediately and they, once they got it, I mean, they were all in on this stuff and really became a highly sustainable company after that in many different ways. Um, so how did this actually shake out financially? And I'm, I'm done here in about a minute. Um, our act, you know, I'd mentioned earlier that we were really seeking about a 780 pro forma rent. Um, we ended up getting about 675. So it doesn't take a scientist to do that math. Um, we did not get tenants to see the value, I would say, from, um, from the pro forma perspective. We did get them all to actually do what we needed them to do to achieve the lead, the lead points and to um, continue to make the, you know, stay on the process of making the building um, the most sustainable in, this, in the state. Um, but it was an uphill fight to get them to recognize the value and be willing to pay a little bit more. And especially, you know, in a competitive environment where we're going against two or three other buildings that were cheaper than us, and, you know, they'd ask us, hey, we love the location, but if you can't match this building's rate, then we're not in. And we try to sell them on all the great things, and they'd go to the other building. But uh, I had mentioned earlier, we really only, we needed one of these things to be right um, to make the financial return on the sustainability stuff. And this is... Um, the investors, the capital markets I mentioned earlier are the ones that are like starting to put their money where their mouth is on this stuff. And quite frankly, when we were getting comfortable with this, this is where I thought the market would be at this point. So I would say that I guessed right. Um, but the the investors, particularly in you know California, New York, Florida, um, the coastal investors, sustainable and you know um, being environmentally friendly is not innovative to them. It's just a new normal. They're, they're dealing with this stuff even more so than we are here. So it was a really easy sell to the investor community. Um, and we are right now in the process of selling this building and are um, close to being under contract on it with a group that um, just could not stop talking about this midway story to their executives, the sustainability aspect of it, the fact that they are going you know, own the most sustainable building in Minnesota. The first speculative multi-tenant building in the nation to receive lead silver. Um, all of this stuff, the story stuff, I think has certainly impacted um, the value. This is just what we had put into, or what our investment team had put into the uh, investment package. So, again, I wasn't going to try to make it too easy for the brokers, but since uh, Mike's only, well, there's a couple brokers in the room. Um, you know, we needed, a, we needed to sell this building at $120 a foot to make money. Um, typically, when you're a dollar lower in rent than you pro forma, you're underwater in a big way. Um, but in this case, uh, the cap rate that we are selling this building at will set a record in the market when we, get, when we close uh, at something less than 5.5%. So if you divide 6.75 rent, by something less than 5.5%, you will get a number that's close to $130 a square foot, which equals about four and a half to $5 million of profit. So at the end of the day, from a pure, simple, what do you call it before the simple, uh, simple payback, we were hoping to make about three to three and a half million dollars on this investment, and we will make about 33% higher than that. And I would attribute much of that to the story that we were able to sell about the sustainability aspect of this building and about everything that we tried to achieve as we went through this process because like i said from the investor capital market perspective it, it was a really easy um, sell so we didn't save the earth we were potentially too cutting edge for this market uh, we achieved our ambitious sustainability goals we did not achieve our rent we did have multiple bidders anxious to crush the current cap rate record and so if we could do it all again, we would, except we would just do it greener. That's it. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Doug Farr and Chris Lee. Um, Doug, as you'll see from his bio, is an author, architect, urban designer. Um, I saw and met Doug earlier this year at the International Living Future Institute's conference out in Seattle. And um, 
Chris Lee, uh, many of you know, uh, those of us in uh, the broker commercial real estate world uh, have seen Chris before. He was just in town earlier this year for a NAMP event. Um, I saw him at one probably two years ago uh, and was also inspired. Um, well known in the industry as a soothsayer, crystal ball reader, um, and really brilliant mind in this regard. So we uh, brought these folks in from out of town to really round out the event today and really helped us connect what has been everything from uh, climate change, doom and gloom uh, is the feedback I've heard through very detailed building design and analysis and now connecting back out to the larger and broader marketplace. Um, so with that, I give you Doug Farr. We doing? No lunch coma, right? That was for the first uh, chunk of speakers. <laughs> Don't ever, Monty, call speakers chunks. That's just, <laughs> just not polite. It's just not polite. So anyway, good afternoon. My name is Doug Farr. I'm an architect and town planner and now author, um, a Detroit native uh, living in Chicago almost 40 years. So I have both uh, Midwest uh, humility, but kind of an urban grit going on. So, um, so I'll crack my first joke, this uh, talk today, hacking our primitive brains to respond faster to climate change. I was talking to Monty about the prep. It's like, you know, he said, well, you know, it's a broker community and a realtor community and they're just, they're kind of getting up to speed on this. And I said, will it be offensive if I talk about primitive brains? He said, no, not at all. They'll, they'll relate, they'll relate. So that was the joke, okay. So if you don't recognize this still, it's from the movie 2001 where the brain, the ape, figures out tools and uses it to crush a skull and we're all inspired and spins off into science fiction. So um, what I'm going to talk about really is motivation, brain, decision making and all the kind of merged science on all of that. But before I do that, let me establish my credentials in the other categories. I'm an architect in Chicago. This is one of our buildings. It's a net zero energy house um, in the city of Chicago. And it's a style we call environmental expressionism, that at a glance you can tell what, what it does. That could be a whole talk. We do town planning. This is a place we planned. Um, it's called Uptown, and it's a for a town called Normal, Illinois. And I'll just say when your town is called Normal, you have to work harder. So, so they are now a model of sustainability in their town and, and around the country. And uh, they're uh, very well regarded on the lecture circuit. And they just landed. Um, a new startup company called Rivian Trucks or Rivian Vehicles. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's the kind of the truck competitor to Tesla. So they're all electric trucks. Uh, Amazon just invested $800 million and placed an order for their first 100,000 trucks off the assembly line. So the kind of confluence of the sustainable place seemed to attract sustainable business. But So this is the timeline of our firm's work. Above the line are buildings we've designed. Below the lines are places we have planned. And this runs, uh, you know, not quite 30 years. And so I've been doing this for a generation. And looking at some of you, you've been doing it at least as long as I have. So, uh, but many of you not. Um, but you get a perspective and you learn things and you hope to sort of turn around and um, sort of share those insights. So this was my first book, which came out in 2007 called Sustainable Urbanism, Urban Design with Nature. And I was lucky it was the first a book to market in the space about how cities and places could be sustainable, not just standalone buildings. So sold well. I was deluded that that would happen again and again and again. But in 2000, my uh, publisher was after me to do an updated version. And I sat down to do that in 2014 and 2015 and realized in six years, the sustainability world, uh, or at least my impression of it, had changed so thoroughly, uh, uh, a new book had to happen. And what were those cues that made me feel like uh, we were off, uh, you know, kind of things had changed. Um, and as Monty said, I will spend 5% on the kind of uh, how bad things are, how bad things are going to get, and hopefully 95% of what the hell to do about it. So, but we've all seen these charts, or if you haven't, they're just, you know, pathways. They're scenarios about what the future looks like uh, that are low, uh, low middle, high middle, and high uh, CO2 concentrations globally. And every time the report is updated every five years, guess what? We're always on the high trajectory. So we've never really broken the curve much at all. Uh, much closer to home is this map, which, uh, you know, I can, uh, this graphic, if you ever want to communicate to anybody what the heck's going on here and why they should care, 
this one seems to catch people's attention. I don't have this map for Minnesota, but we could make it, I'm sure. This shows um, the state of Illinois where I live, and it's projected um, kind of how it's, me, how its climate is projected to move, to shift, not physically move, but to shift to be that of Texas in the year 2100. And so Chicago, like Minneapolis, is a heating dominated climate for buildings, but um, if the projection is true, we will become Dallas and we will become an air conditioning center. And I suspect if this is, if I could just guess, you would too. So, so this one gets people alarmed and also to say as an architect, we're trained to design a building to be uniquely suited to the place it sits and its climate. So if I build a building that lasts 100 years, which climate should I design to? Everything between Chicago and Texas. So, so that's a, that's a, a challenge and an opportunity. So here's, as a plan, the architect brain that I work on, the buildings we design, uh, you know, are two to 12 years in duration. The projects, that's how long they take. The places we plan, 20 to 100 years. So I'm, I'm always got my kind of eye on the clock, how long things take, it's about time. This one's the mind blower of a chart. It's 30,000 years. If you can see this, 20,000 years going up to today, this is kind of the CO2 spikes in the next 10,000 years. And look up at the upper right corner. I'll show it in detail and hopefully it'll make sense. That little red line is our lifetime. So in a 30,000 year long thing, our lifetime is just a little sliver. Now, if our lifetime had happened anywhere along history where it was pretty flat, nothing was changing, no consequence, no blood, no foul. Um, but it's happening now where this spike in CO2 is happening. And this is kind of my last dire slot or two. Um, CO2, here's the concentration of CO2. Here's a rough, how it equates to sea level rise. Here's that, or in temperature rise, excuse me, and then in sea level rise. And the sort of simple math for yourself, if you want to think about it, every degree centigrade that the heat, Earth's temperature heats up, the sea is predicted to rise basically seven and a half feet, which is the tallest player in the NBA. So if you want to think that you're standing in the ocean, looking out at the shore and say, what if a really tall guy was standing next to me? That's how where the water would go. Every one degree, one degree, one degree. So anyway, what I would think about this. This is a chart. It's data. People don't actually respond to data. That's one of the things that we're wired to ignore what I've just told you. So think about it. I mean, I told you the human dimension of oh, how clever a tall NBA player. But when you see this chart, think of your children and their children and their children. That's something that's we were proven to care about. I don't know why we care about our children, but we sure do, and uh, we should. So uh, let's keep doing that. So, but what is the takeaway from this is that, um, sorry about the graphics, jumped around a little bit here, but the gist of it is, what this says is, and you may not have heard this term, stranding carbon. We need to leave the carbon underground. Coal, petroleum, oil, and natural gas, right? All three, and there's, Here's a map that shows where the concentrations of those commodities are traded, on what world markets they're traded, uh, New York, Moscow, London, uh, all big places. But basically the game is leave it in the ground. Do not extract it. And the lesson is don't extract it more slowly, just stop. Does that make sense? We all got that message. So if, you get, if you're taking notes, just write the word stop. That'll get you. But anyway, what we need to do is to strand carbon underground as soon as possible. Every, people are here are in the economics field, so you know what a stranded asset is. The classic one is, you know, you bought a piece of land and you can't get a road to it, so you can't develop it, can't get any, realize any, uh, extract any value out of it. That's the premise, that's the out, desired outcome uh, from this conversation. So in the ASAP, in the last slide, was the implication that what we're talking about is time as soon as possible, that's time. So this chart inspired me, which I saw about five years ago in a Bloomberg publication. What it shows is, and in some ways the specifics don't matter, it's a 200 year timeline across the x-axis, and then these are six different legal issues. And what you'll see is, it, as it starts, when it lands in a circle, that's when a, an issue that started at the state level was uh, sort of made legal at the federal level. The longest one of which is uh, interracial marriage took seven generations to go from somebody, some state said we should legalize this to it being federally acceptable. Much faster was uh, uh, same-sex marriage, which was 11 years. So, so is 
what are the lessons to draw from this? Change can take incredibly long time because this isn't physical change. It's not like redesigning our buildings or how our cities are. This is paper. This is law. This is conduct. This is values, custom, culture, and so on. What happened that it went from seven, seven generations to 11 years? So anyway, that chart inspired us to do some research for the book, and I'm going to share some of it with you. All the data I will show is U.S. only. We have an international visitor from Nottingham, England um, here, so uh, we'll honor her. Uh, but anyway, here's U.S. CO2 output. This data comes from the source that Ed Masria gets it from, and you can see as of 2005 that our CO2 output peaked. It's kind of flattened out. I think it's kind of going uh, pretty steady from there. We actually count the number of generations, 25-year uh, generations back to a kind of uh, generation zero in 3100 BCE. But there you go. And so here's what we're supposed to do, right? The way this issue has been framed is we will fail. We have failed if we don't stop uh, heating the planet uh, to exceed one and a half degrees, right? So everyone's got that message. You got it a couple times this morning. Uh, you probably won't get it again from me. So I think that framing has been, it was, the choice to do it was motivated to inspire some sense of urgency. We've got to get moving, right? Which, you know, is certainly clear in that communication. The unintended side, of, side effect, and this is back to our primitive brains, is we failed. We're probably not going to make the 1.5. I mean, you can do, uh, Rick was talking about it this morning, like if Minnesota did everything possible perfectly, we'd get close, right? So. I think we need to let go of that and stop punishing ourselves that we failed. It was an unrealistic goal, and we should set some realistic goals and focus on the solutions, not on what we didn't do. So the 11 years metric is a thing. So um, we've done this in the United States. We've sort of mobilized and turned on a dime. Arguably, it was the Second World War, and there was a clear common enemy. This is the, uh, you know, the Axis powers, World War II, we stopped making washing machines and instead made torpedoes. We stopped selling cars and instead made tanks. And that took 18 months to flip the, the economy over. But at the end of that time, during the height of the Second World War, 60% of the U.S. economy was federal government, basically buying tanks, buying planes. So if you want to do that, that's one, one way to do it. But I don't think we have an agreement on that sort of common enemy and common urgency. So this is an audience participation moment. So I've started the little slide, peaked in 2005, and I want to ask you, when do you think the United States will decarbonize its economy? So this is a multiple choice question, which is please actually choose just one of the answers. So don't keep your hand up. So uh, A, 2030, B, 2050, C, 2070, D, 2090. So who thinks we will decarbonize by the year 2030? Okay, that is, to my record, no votes. B, 2050, okay. 40% half room edge, something like that. C, 2070, few, few, fewer, and D, D 2090. Ah, the pessimists. Okay, thank you. So I, I don't know if we had done that by profession. I don't know, were the architects on the front end or the back end, the realtors and brokers? So um, we should have done it scientifically, but we didn't do that. So to answer this question, there, one is there is no way of answering this question because it's in the future. But you know what? There's an interesting thing we came up with called a change line. It, is, it basically allows us to make a comparison to other trends that, that we can say have reversed themselves. Because that's kind of what we're talking about. We started using fossil fuels around the Industrial Revolution, 1850. We want it to go to zero. How long does that take? So, so we did these change lines of other, other changes, other trends. And the one that I'm going to talk about today is U.S. cigarette smoking cessation. So this is uh, a terrible topic. It you know, uh, kills something like 500,000 Americans a year, uh, but it's a great data set because the cigarette rolling machine was invented in the 1890s. So while Lord knows humans have smoked all kinds of wacky stuff for millennia, cigarettes really started uh, in the last century. So in 1900, there's statistics that show 1% of Americans smoked uh, that habit peaked in 1963, the year before the Surgeon General's report, and is, was, was until the invention of vaping and e-cigarettes well on its way to kind of a resolution. So vaping and e-cigarettes is kind of a footnote here, so I'm going to just set that aside, but just say, look, study the shape of the curve. 
So it took basically six generations to get to our peak use of CO2, and what, what will it take uh, to go away? So what we did was we superimposed the smoking line, uh, and then we're going to superimpose the CO2 line over the top. So it answers the question, what would it look like if we decarbonized our economy at the rate we quit smoking? And smoking, by the way, was the best, most successful public health campaign, arguably campaign, non-military campaign of any type in the history of our country. If we did it at that rate, what does that look like? And the answer is 2150. So you pessimists, what letter would that be? E, F, G, H, I. So it says probably I would have, might have been the right answer if you believe this projection. Okay? So I've been showing this slide for three years. And as I said to Monty in the shower this morning, I finally had the great revelation of I've been describing it wrong this whole time. So one thing is this is simply a projection. If you don't know, this is a laptop, and this is a projection, and that's a line on the screen. None of this has happened. So if your emotions are in your gut, because you've just seen terrible things, nothing has happened. Nothing has happened. But what I am doing, and this, this data does, is frames some relationship, your emotional relationship, to a trajectory we're all on together and that none of us control. Make sense that kind of we're, we're in the same spot? And so one thing that environmental, or excuse me, uh, behavioral psychology has taught us over the last few years is that fear can freeze you. So if you're afraid, uh, you are less creative, less risk-taking, you pull back, you stop, you become a turtle. Pull, pull those legs in, pull that head back in, ride it out, right? So. The last thing I want to give this room is fear, right? I've shown you a projection. What are we supposed to do with this projection? But I know if I leave you afraid, you'll all go back and say, so God, honey, kids, I saw this talk at lunch. Oh my God, it's so hopeless. You know, let's sell the house. We're moving this, you know, somewhere on higher ground. It's all terrible. No, no, we don't know that. But I'm going to argue both sides of what that line means. And I'm going to start with arguing against in favor of the pessimistic point of view, which is why one point of view of that line, the 2150 line, is that that is our best hope. And then the other line I'm going to argue is it's our worst case scenario. So that, so where you can see both sides of this. Why it should be our best hope grounds in this man. So who here is Spock? Does anyone here Spock? Is anyone here rational, right? So this is, I was saying to, uh, to the table this morning, when I'm in Minnesota and I'm in the Twin Cities, this is the place in the country that just feels like if we show the, the feeling of the place, we show a chart and it shows that it's better that you do this, the expectation is people respond to data and are motivated to take action based on data and rational things. It's in your self-interest, so you, therefore you'll do it. Uh, that's what Spock would do. You know, Captain, 53% part six, you know, we should do it. Like, that's what I think. That's not, that's not our brain. That's not what we're wired for. And I can prove it to you. So this is a thing called heuristics. Have people heard that term? In uh, the one I'm going to talk about is heuristics is, um, uh, was a term invented by Daniel Kahneman and his research partner, Amos Tversky. You'll see his picture in a minute. That looks at the cognitive quirks in our brain proof that we're not remotely rational. So here's one of my favorite ones. So if uh, anyone here good at math? So if you give a room full of people either of these uh, questions, one at a time, the one on the top first and the one on the bottom second, the order in which you give the question to people determines what their guess is. You don't give them enough time to actually do the math in their head. So on average, a room full of uh, Americans will guess that the answer to the bottom question is 524. A uh, separate room full of Americans will guess that the answer to the one on the top is 2300. So what is, should these be the same answer I'm thinking? Right, so are we rational? No, we're tricked by the first number we see. If we see a one, we guess lower. If we see an eight, we guess higher. Are we rational? Are we Spock? Hell no. Jesus, why would you think people would respond to data if we can fall for that trick? 
The other thing you learn about this is that Americans suck at math because the actual answer is 43,000 and some. So we are, you know, we're guessing 500 when it's 43,000. So we don't know what we're talking about. Second, second one, and this is probably uh, uh, Kahneman's greatest sort of insight, is this term loss aversion. And it comes, it's an emotional thing. And it's not, you know, it's not about, you know, data or whatever. It is the emotional pain we feel from a loss is twice as powerful as the pleasure we get from a gain. What does that tell you? We're conservative. We don't want to part with things. And when we get things, it's okay. But if I lost it, man, I'm really mad, right? What does it say? We're wired to stay in a steady state, to not change. Tomorrow should be like today. Did you ever see the movie Groundhog's Day? Poor guy wakes up every morning to Sonny and Cher. Oh my God, right? That's us. So we think it's funny in a movie. It's our lives. So, and why in the world would any of that be true? So another one is called the escalation of commitment. You could think of this as what we oftentimes do collectively at wartime. We commit to the Vietnam War. We think it's a bad idea. We know it's a bad idea. It's now a terrible idea. And we just stick with it. And we have current wars that, that are closer to home and closer to our hearts right now that this is true for. So what this tells you is when we make a decision, even after we've concluded it makes no sense for us, we stick with it. Escalation of commitment. It's called doubling down, right? So we're wired to fear loss and to stay the course even when we know it's wrong. Are we Spock? Heck no, right? So, so why would we be this crazy, quirky thing? Well, we evolved from uh, other, other mammals, and we evolved in a kind of clan or family group uh, setting, a social group uh, of relatives and near relatives and sort of trusted intimates. Uh, and we, you know, we did this for millennia and millennia. And it became a civilization. We uh, got our uh, agriculture. We landed in permanent settlements and so on. But basically, we we're always in small groups of people. And that we relied, worked as teams to, you know, gather food, protect ourselves, uh, you know, throw ceremonies and so on like that. So we are inherently social beings with a lot of our wiring being about emotions. Another heuristic is one, this one called representativeness heuristic, which is if we get our friends around and we're talking to our friends or family saying, hey, what do you think of this idea? Ah, it's a really good idea. We will say the group of six people that kind of nodded at whatever I just said, well, the world, I, I think it's a good idea. And everybody I'm talking to thinks it's a really good idea. And we make the mistake of saying, well, therefore, it must be a good idea. Or that, that group of six is really representative of, the, of a bigger sample, right? So we trick ourselves. And so when you look at the sort of political polarization, however you want to look at this, we get in our little clubs and we, we're in a little echo chamber and we reinforce what we all think. So again, are we rational? No. We're emotional, we're social, we're all those things. And why in the world would we trust the, the small group of people around us? Because it built social cohesion when social cohesion was the thing that kept you from getting eaten by a lion or forgetting to store food for the winter or whatever the hell was the thing that kept you alive. Now, elevate this up past kind of a small family group or kinship group of you know, 50 or 100 or a couple hundred uh, up to our government. So public trust in government, this is the, the chart of it, uh, was high in the, in the mid sort of century uh, when women were uh, kept out, people of color were kept out, uh, white men ran the world, we drank a lot of martinis, and we trusted government. I don't think we were paying attention. I'm not quite sure. I wasn't an adult at the time. But, you know, Vietnam, Watergate, other crises, and then an active campaign to discredit the work of government, which has been going on for you 50 years. And if you haven't read it, you can read the book Dark Money. But basically, people at the campaign said, a dollar spent by government is a dollar wasted. That wasn't believed a long time ago. That is, that is a predominant thought. That thought was planted in our heads. Okay? That was an active campaign to get you to think that. This is interesting. 57% of Americans know none or few of their neighbors. So, so I'm, on the, I'm on the rant here about why it's hopeless and why 150 would, or 2150 would be great. We're irrational. We, we hear fake things and believe them. Uh, we don't know our neighbors. We are not generous with our time. On average, Americans volunteer in their community 20 minutes a month. That's three hours. I'll do the math. Three hours per year, that's a long movie, right? 
That's crazy. We think of ourselves as generous. We're not. And then this one, this one's like the topper. America's greatest fear is the year 2015. Um, second from the right is 30% of Americans' greatest fears was dying. On the right, 58% by far, the, almost double the, the strength of that, talking to strangers. So, okay, this is pretty pathetic. We don't know our neighbors, we don't care to know our neighbors, we're not generous with our time, we believe the people around us in little echo chambers, we're not rational, we do the wrong thing and stick with it, and heaven forbid you should try and change in an age that begs us to do things differently. We're not wired for any of that. So you with me on this primitive brain thing? Like, I would choose a different species to be working with. And I love you all personally, but just if we could opt out of this human thing, because the chassis is a really bad chassis, right? So that's why the 2150 would be great given this chaotic, irrational animal that we've been forced to work with. On the flip side, hope. So if I give hope, if I make you smile, this is the other thing that behavioral economics has taught us, people that smile are optimistic and they are motivated. So we're smiling, we're doing a little laughing here, a little laughing, and that is by both design and uh, because I think it's the right thing. So why decarbonization in 2050 is our worst case scenario. And I associate worst case scenario with Prairie Home Companion and Garrison. And there was that segment in Prairie Home was like worst, I forget what it was, like you're walking down the street and 747's coming at you and a school bus jumps the curb and six of the things worst case scenario. So you can, you can do that. But I think the way I like to use that chart is to say, beat that. That, I don't know if it's the rum line, I don't know quite what it is, but I think we should aim to beat it. So, the book, which I wrote, Sustainable Nation, there's a copy sitting around somewhere. If, you're, if it's on your table, pick it up and hand it to the next person so you can all take a look. Um, that one copy is for sale. It'll be a bid after you've been drinking multiple drinks, and we'll see how much money we can get out of that, and we'll donate it to, uh, to something. Um, but anyway, so Sustainable Nation um, recognizes this Yogi Berra quote as funny. In theory, there is no difference between theory and practice, but in practice, there is. So we needed a theory. So if we're not going to spend all of our time talking about how bad it's going to be, we need a theory, we need a plan going forward. So that's what we're going to talk about. The basis of what I'm going to say to you today is the people in this room fit the profile of how to, how to, how to get this done. And that is a small group of people. And this Margaret Mead quote, um, which you have to pay $75 for, by the way, to put in your you think quotes are in the public domain? No, this one is intellectual property, $75 to put it in your book. So thanks to Margaret Mead or her descendants anyway. But, um, you know, but you can quote me saying it for free. So, but anyway, um, uh, small, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens has changed the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. The U.S. Green Building Council was founded by three people, the Congress for New Urbanism by six people. Uh, the Living Bill, International Living Futures Institute by one person. So you can make a lot of difference in our world uh, in small groups. In fact, it's the only thing that's ever made a difference. What I realize over the last couple of years given this talk is, um, you know, I'll give a talk and say, oh, Doug, I love what you said about carbon, and it's really important. But, you know, it's really got to start at the top. The fe if federal government's got to lead on this. And uh, it just makes me so mad because I've just spent an hour saying, you know, small groups of people need to lead. And they say, no, no, federal government's got to gotta lead. And we're wired to wait. We're wired for a signal from the top. Now, I, older than many of you, I voted for Jimmy Carter in part because anybody vote for Jimmy Carter? Because he was going to impose, what was that called? A gas tax. So that was 1976. Still waiting. 50 years, still, still waiting. Jimmy. What happened to the gas tax? So it never happened. So our expectation that the king will step out on the balcony and say, do what I say, is an unrealistic expectation. And it, what it leads us to is procrastination. So in fact, I saw, in fact, were, were you there? Yeah, you were there uh, at, um, at the 4.1 rollout in Chicago, the procrastination syndrome. I've never heard, heard that phrase, but it's exactly what's going on here. And so we expect crazy things to happen from the top, which they will not happen. They're sure, surely not happening um, in this cycle. 
But the sweet spot is somewhere in the neighborhood and the professional organizations. This is where uh, change is going to take place. And why would that be given our small family uh, structure, you know, the, our sort of clan or our tribe, whatever term you want to use, why would we somehow work really well in small groups? That's how we evolved. We didn't have governments you know, we trusted, and we don't trust them now. So uh, why would we think otherwise? So this is an interesting data set, and the references down there at the, at the bottom. There's six listed here things you can't read, so I'll just tell you what it is. These are, this uh, study was, was looking at um, the different ways that you can com communicate environmental, uh, communicate to persuade people to undertake environmental conduct. Okay. And the number here, the kind of point 0.1 up to point two, 0.2, two, is the lowest effectiveness to the highest effectiveness. Social norms, the bottom one, is basically a message that says you should recycle. People recycle, good people recycle, you should recycle. So does that motivate you? No. The study confirms your head shake. So no, that doesn't work. What do we spend most of our time doing? Sending emails, establishing social norms. Perfect. So what we spend our time at is not, is proven ineffective. But wait, why would we stick with it? We are trained to double down and stay on the course, the wrong course, even after we've been told it doesn't work. So what's interesting is the top two. Point six is public commitment, which is I, Doug Farr, hereby commit Farr Associates that we're going to approach every project, uh, every architecture project in our office as though um, fee as passive house with a code. So I'm living in some far-flung future where the, the world got it right, and we're operating as though that were true. I just said that to you, I say it in the office, it's mostly true. So, so that's like, you say it publicly, you declare it, and why would that be powerful? Wait a minute, you're standing up in front of the campfire in your, your village or your, your small family group, and you've said something. You've promised it to the people around you. It's a social contract. We are social people. We are not rational people. We are social people. Why? That, that's why that's powerful. And the top one, walk leader, is really interesting. So you think of like, is that probably somebody, it's a residential setting. It's kind of the walk busybody, the walk person that knows all your business, knows your kids' birthdays, knows your dog's names and favorite snacks. I mean, like the whole, it's somebody that you can't shake, right? They're there. It's like, you know, hey, hey Doug, uh, uh, you know we're in a drought and you left your sprinkler on all night. You do know that. Uh, Doug, hey, you know, we're in a kind of carbon crisis and you left your lights on in the garage. You know, like, oh, my God, you know, I can't get away from this person. So, but it doesn't have to be just residential. There could and should be a block captain on this topic in your whatever this, I think in every room and gathering. So, so block captain is a powerful thing. It's someone you can't escape. Someone you see face to face, and I'll tell you an example, a really powerful example of using this block captain thing uh, to great effect with no emails exchanged. And I will say the least effective is virtual, and the, I would argue the only effective is face to face. So what do we obsess with? Virtual. Right? So we're, we're doubling down. So has anybody seen, ever seen a graph or chart like this? Gantt chart, critical path method. You know, Some people winced. I saw a couple of people like, get back to the office if you were wincing too powerfully. But basically this is, I think of it in the context of you want to build a building, you should have a chart like this. And what does it tell you? You start by clearing the site, digging, pouring the foundation, stem, wall, floor, first floor, you know, first floor slab, first floor wall, second floor, blah, blah, blah. And then towards the end is, uh, you know, doorknobs, paint, and, you know, the keys are turned over. And there's a sequence to doing things. So, I believe that the carbon challenge is one that needs to be managed this way. You identify all the parts, you organize them in sequence, and that's how you get it done. Guess what? In, and we're applying this inventory of who's doing what in Chicago. What we found was, if you can imagine a Gantt chart where uh, basically only 10% of the parts are there, and they're all in a scrambled order. So it's like there's a guy with a pickup truck with two square shingles, He's ready to go. There's a five-gallon bucket of paint and, you know, a pickup truck with re-rod, and that's what we got. We're building a house. No, no. And the guy in the painting really wants to get it done this afternoon. Like, he wants to go first. Like, wait, nothing to paint. That's how we're approaching it now. So we should be pessimistic until we elevate it 
and see ourselves as disorganized and being very emotional in the things we do and self-validating. The other thing I'll say, and this is said with a lot of love, and I'm guilty of it too, we tend to rationalize that what we're doing is the thing that's right. We don't, oftentimes don't change. We just say, eh, I'm, I'm making a contribution, or I'm doing a gesture, whatever. So we've got this exercise we're gonna be running over the next year, uh, reverse engineering. So imagine a 30 year timeline, and this is Chicago, but it could be anywhere. On the left is your starting point. What is true? Where are we today? On the right, you can find success. And I'll say this a little more about this in a minute. And you say, well, let's figure out, to get from here to success, certainly a number of things had to happen. You know, like uh, codes were passed, or uh, technology dropped in price, whatever. Let's figure out how to do those as quickly as possible. So, so that's part of the theory of change as well. In terms of the book content, who has the book sustained with the hard copy somewhere over there? Um, thank you. Um, so it's got 70 uh, patterns for the future, and it's got six accelerants. And I'm going to talk mostly about accelerants today, um, and you can see them here. If I have a favorite accelerant, it's got to be campaigns. Campaigns are things we've already always done. Military campaigns, fundraising campaigns, political campaigns. Uh, and, and something that Americans are particularly good at, marketing campaigns. We can sell you pretty much anything. I have a bromance with this fictional character, Don Draper, who has been off, off the air for some number of years. The most cynical line I heard from this character's voice was this one. And he's saying this to one of his many girlfriends. What you call love was invented by guys like me to sell you nylon. So like something as cherished as love, don't, Don, don't mess with love. Love's above that, you know, you can't sell nylons with love. Oh baby, we'll use anything to sell you anything. So if we can sell nylons, which I, I've never worn them, um, but you know, I don't think they're necessary, but we convinced, you know, a couple generations of people that they were. Um, oh my God, tell me we can't sell, sell all this. So. So we're gonna indulge in a little kind of future, future thing. Carbon-free Minnesota 2050 or carbon-free Twin Cities. I debated because there's a great word for a person from Minnesota that's a Minnesotan. So sometimes you'll see Minnesotan and I ask the guys here, it's like, what do you call a person that lives in the Twin Cities? A twinner? Uh, you know, what, like, what would it be? Um, so agree there wasn't a, a word, so we, we agreed on Twin City folk. <laughs> so here's, here's, so yeah, if you can improve on that, is that good? Is anyone offended by being called folk? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there, there are divisions in urban gangs. Folk is, you know, one side or the other. So, um, but anyway, here's the statement of success. This is our sort of shared vision of where we're trying to go. At sunrise on Earth Day, which is April 22nd, in the year 2050, Twin City folk, that's you, will no longer burn fossil fuels to heat or power buildings, vehicles, industry, or the grid. Okay, let me just pause. Does this seem like what we should be doing? Okay, now who is doing this? The federal government, right? No. Twin city folk. Folk. Um, that's you. So what we've done is taken a global issue, which is done by individuals, and sometimes their families or their small groups, whatever, it's aggregated because we have a common atmosphere. And then we look for like a global king to step out on the balcony and say, fix this global problem. It's an individual problem. It's a small group problem. It's a family problem. It's a neighborhood problem. It's a city problem. We should solve it at the lowest possible level. So take a moment, inventory your life. Does anyone here drive a vehicle that burns fossil fuel? Show of hands, okay? By what date will you not own a vehicle that burns fossil fuels? Earth Day 2050, cool. Anybody here live in a building or work in a building that burns fossil fuels for heat, let's just say, anybody, okay? Next one, by when will you not do that? Earth Day 2050, and so on and so on. So, um, so we start with a baseline. So just inventory your life. This is the thing you can do. And the gesture that we often do is, we'll have a lot, I see this architect friends of mine, neighbors of mine, they have a house with a stinky old boiler in the basement and they'll put solar panels on the roof. And that's called virtue signaling, which is 
I drive a Prius, I have solar panels, and I'm not going to talk to you about my stinky boiler, right? So like, you're, you're helping with one hand and clawing back a lot of harm with everything else you're doing. And so, so that's us, that's us humans. We're irrational, we're hypocritical, we're incomplete, we're unselfcritical, whatever. So anyway, here's where we start. 2016, 54% of Minnesota's energy was fossil fueled, a lot of coal and natural gas. Um, but you know, pretty good renewables there. This is a guess. I know the number for Chicago, but um, guessing at twin, uh, St. Paul's uh, CO2 and how much comes from buildings. In Chicago, it's 70%. Somebody here, I'm sure, knows, but it's a big chunk. 70? Okay. I hedged, and I put a, both a range and a question mark so that no one would quote me, because <laughs> clearly this man did not know what he was talking about. Um, the next one is, so that's our grid. That's our grid. And so we already, the work between now and 2050 is to figure out how to replace 54% of our dirty grid with clean grid. And I'm going to set aside nuclear for a discussion at the bar. So I don't, just don't have time to do that. But we got a lot of work to do. We got to, you know, get a 50% clean grid. Uh, buildings is clearly a big part of it. I'm sorry about the graphic jump here. But let's say we shifted to all electric vehicles, which I think you all just did a public declaration that you were going to do that. I saw your hands in the air. I think that's going to happen. So what if we did that? What does that do to our grid? Well, it may double it. So the 54% is now 154%. We have to clean up what we have and double it in size to accommodate our vehicles. And then electrification of heating. And this is probably, you know, kind of frontier issues up here, you'll tell me. But these are numbers that feel pretty good for Chicago. Um, and so by, I'm just sort of sharing those. So if we shifted how we heated buildings from burning gas in them to using sort of heat pump technologies and other things, Guess is it might triple the grid. So we had to do 54%. Then with the vehicles, 154%. Now with the heating the buildings, 254%. Right? Now that doesn't assume any conservation or efficiency or you know driving less, better insulation, all those kinds of things. But it sure sets up a game. So and this uh, Boston is ahead of us. I think Minneapolis, St. Paul is ahead of Chicago. But they did the study and basically said, if Boston electrified everything, we need to triple the grid, right? And the other thing that they found was that our, most grids peak out at some hot summer afternoon, like in August, August at 5 o'clock, because the office power is still on, and the cars are driving home, and the lights and power are going on at home, so like every building's powered up, and it all needs air conditioning. But what they found was it shifts to the coldest winter night on the week when the wind didn't blow and the sun wasn't out, right? So it makes sense, right? So that's it. So suddenly heating and efficiency in heating becomes a driver of what, how big your grid has to be because you have to size it for the peak. So what do you do? Okay, so I've laid it out. That's kind of at least we've got clarity about where we want to get the carbon-free Twin Cities and where we start. We've got a lot of work to do. And if we just electrify everything, we, the grid grows and it's very expensive and it takes a long time. So where do we start? As I said, in my public declaration, our office is one of the patterns in the book. Our office is committed to trying to do FIAS, which is called Passive House. If you've never heard of it, a super insulation standard for buildings, Passive House US. Uh, we, as, we pretend it's code. And so we start every project. We do the energy modeling that way. And we often get pushback from our client. We sort of settle, settle in for, for a little less, but we've educated them. And the next time, it's a little easier. We get a little further and all that kind of stuff. So that's that's my ideal. But if you do it one building at a time, that's pretty slow going. So you say, well, maybe the thing we should do here is do a code, right? We should just do a code that mandates all the really good stuff. And the codes tend to start with new construction ahead of rehab. This is a chart that shows the, um, both the history and the projected future of what the IECC building code will do. So this is the sort of national code that's adopted by states and uh, municipalities, counties, and, and cities. Um, you know, uh, for both commercial and residential use. And you can see here, it started in the kind of mid-80s after the uh, early oil shocks. And you can see it's updated every three years. And the size of the arrow shows you the uh, percent by which energy efficiency mandates increased. So, you know, 10% improvement in that cycle, 14% in that, 2%, 2%, 1%, very little bit. And then Whoa, Ed Masria started talking to these people right about here, who is the 2030 guy. He said, you know, you really got to be 
are aiming for 20, zero at 2030. So the steps you can see are going really aggressive, right? So you get like 18% in one code cycle. So who pushes back on that? Nobody, right? Nobody, nobody cares. People love that. Oh my God, 18% more, I love it. You saw, you saw the morning sessions. People hate that. Developers push back, ULI pushes back. Um, one developer calls one mayor and this thing is dead, it's iced. So we're in this quandary where we wanna go really fast, but we have pushback. So we did this study that basically, this is kind of three charts together. What we found was on average, it takes, after a code is adopted, it takes, uh, excuse me, written, it takes six years for half of the states, all states you know, have the option of adopting code. It takes um, six years for that code to be adopted. So even if we had the perfect code in 2030, not assuming a lot of things, it wouldn't get adopted until 2040, and that's by half the states. So the other half, 2050, 2060. So can a code alone get us there? No. But we learned one thing, that the engine of the code are buildings that voluntarily exceed requirements. Why would that be? If you're a mayor or you're a kind of building code official, you say, can we impose this requirement on everyone? Well, has any, I don't know, has anybody done this? And if you go out in the marketplace, you find people, happy people like the gentleman that sold his building with a five cap this morning, that was incredible. He would probably be pretty happy. It's like, would you do that again? Yes, I would. And here's how I make money more. So you have to have those examples. So when you're trolling in your life and doing all your stuff, when you go to buildings, like, ask, did you exceed code? Because those are drivers of a faster uptake uh, on codes. Um, and then I'll just say, this is the other pattern that we believe in is to position all buildings to be net zero ready. That is to say, they're designed to be super efficient, kind of like Rick was talking about with his building. You make it efficient and then you add the, the renewables last, okay? But the sol solar ready or the net zero ready is the cheaper part. It's like half of your premium from this morning, I wanna say, was, was just the getting it ready. Do this. And I'm gonna convince you don't install the solar panels. You can hear me on that one. So one of the most powerful pilgrim uh, accelerants is this thing called pilgrimage sites. What do we mean by that? So we all learn by seeing, touching, kicking, licking, doing whatever, experiencing things. And particularly when it comes to innovation, to read about something is not nearly as powerful or as immersive as, as, as touching it. Now this was um, confirmed by, um, who, what's this woman's name? Um, Jane Goodall, thank you, who uh, spoke two years ago in Chicago and had this great quote. Culture is observed behavior passed from one generation to the next. How would she draw that conclusion by observing non-human, um, you know, sp uh, basically apes and gorillas and Chimpanzees, I think she's worked with chimpanzees. So this is how we learn. Somebody teach it, does it, you watch it, and you model it. Modeling behavior, right? So can you do that reading an article in a magazine? Maybe, but not nearly the way you can by going and touching and verifying with yourself that it works, right? And this is this great Bill Gitt, William Gibson quote, the future's already here, it's just not very evenly distributed. So there is one bullet center, which was already talked about this morning, so I'm not going to say anything about it, other than it's considered the most sustainable commercial building in the United States. It's in Seattle, and we've all had this conversation where you travel around and say, you know, gee, um, Toledo, Ohio, gee, St. Paul, Minnesota, gee, uh, Detroit, Michigan, you should do a bullet center. And say, well, you know, they can do that stuff in Seattle, but it doesn't work here, right? And that's one of these tricks, like, that we play on ourselves to say, no, there's nothing, you know, physics aren't different, you know, the climate's a little different, whatever. So you have to localize these things. And so, um, you know, the way we think about this is one thing that you can do that absolutely will accelerate change on all of this stuff is to build one of, a, basically a bullet center in every neighborhood in St. Paul, and then the next level is on every block, right? And to do the neighborhood, one per neighborhood in 2022, like three years out, so that's what, 12, 15 neighborhoods, and then one on every block for 2025. And then it's completely normal. Hey, I don't believe in this net zero. You can walk to one. There's one across town and three years later, there's still one down on the corner, right? That's how you localize it. That's how we learn we are, you know, of, of our social club. And if it's in, you know, in and close to us, we'll believe it. So 
So here's more solutions, framing choices to get better outcomes. This is, in my next life, I would hope to be this man, Daniel Kahneman. And if you want to buy a book today, you should buy Sustainable Nation. And then after that, you can buy this book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Uh, but so this is the guy that understands the quirks of the human brain pretty much better than anybody. And he was asked, like, Professor Kahneman, how do you change people's behavior? And this, this was just in a video, and he's, he caught him in between lectures, and he said, that's a silly question. You can't do that. He said, I think of it this way. If you want, to, want people to do, if what you want people to do is such a good idea, ask yourself, why aren't they doing it already? Right, so, so we show data and expect them to change. No, people don't act on data. That's what Spock does. Well, there's only one Spock. So, so this idea of wrapping yourself as a kind of dashboard of what are the choices? What are they looking at? What, are the, you know, what, what, what motivates them to do things? We are in the financial services, financial industry, we are trained to believe in the power of diminishing returns. You invest to a certain point and then you stop, right? And look at this, this is, this is just off the internet. Um, here's where you're supposed to stop and then it's labeled biggest time waster. Like if you aren't getting the message that you're an idiot if you keep going, there's proof of it. So you should stop, right? Diminishing returns, go to a certain point. What that misses is that there's another chart going on called opportunity costs. So let's say you're building a building, renovating a building, and you say, uh, I'm going to decide how much insulation I'm going to put in. And uh, diminishing return says two inches. So we're going to put two inches on the wall. You say, and then the price of gas goes up, or oil goes up, or gas goes up a couple years later. Oh, geez, we should have done three inches, or four inches, whatever. What's the cost of going back? This study will tell you that it is um, 5x. So imagine going back and removing all the finishes to go either the, on the outside or the inside to, to do it later. So there's an opportunity cost moment to get it right. So, so we're big believers and we should set our target on what the building envelope needs to be for forever, for the future, for 2050, whatever you want to say, and do it once. And to not install photovoltaics. Now, why? They'll be cheaper next year and they'll have higher output. And a lot of people try and do both at the same time and it starves the building envelope of money because you're trying to save enough money to do the PVs to get to net zero, right? We all want to get to net zero, but I'm hoping, so don't, I'm gonna, heresy, don't buy PVs. Don't install them on your building unless, I don't know, for, maybe there's exceptions there. But spend the money, make the building envelope the windows, the insulation, the thermal bridging, and so on, best possible, and defer this, because it's only going to get better in the future. I'm wrapping up. I can see Monty's standing, and that's five is probably means negative 15. Or, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, okay, perfect. Yeah. So uh, I'm very close. Community of practice. So a community of practice is the last accelerator I'm going to talk about, and uh, it's basically a group of people that meet to um, share their work, uh, critique and hone their skills, and that they care about their social standing in the group. And so the classic uh, version of this is the Congress for New Urbanism, which I've been involved in for about 25 years. Intense critique, intense awards, intense social strata. You, you know, did you speak? Did you win an award? All kinds of stuff. So, um, and I'll just say briefly, one of the challenges we're trying to solve in Chicago is the glass box-ism. So, these are two buildings that are uh, you know, in the marketplace today, built in the last two years. Uh, on the left is sort of 85% facade glass. On the right is about 40% facade glass. Jo I don't know these particular buildings, but the, the number is between 9 and 23% more energy is used simply be because the facade is overglazed. Right? So how, what, do you, what do you have to do to get architects to think differently? Architects are generational thinkers. They were trained by their teachers. They carry to their death what they were trained was a good idea. And so this is the, this is the culprit between, behind all this. This is Mies van der Rohe's sketch, a charcoal sketch for the first glass tower in 1921. Everyone aspires in the year 2019 to still build this 98-year-old idea. And I have friends that design glass. So I said, would you quit doing that? I said, Doug, I'm a glass box modernist and I will stop the day I die, says my friend. Like, don't say it that way. It puts me in an awkward you know, emotion. So, um, 
So what we've been doing the last couple of years is working with the AIA, the American Institute of Architects in Chicago, to make it a community of practice. And so how are we doing this in a very uh, wise and kind of um, family structure way? The architects in Chicago get together one night a year, design night, which is a week from Friday. Uh, they all wear black and they stand around and give each other awards, right? So it's the perfect setting for like what you're standing and so on. So we've been trying to build uh, uh, interest and firm commitment in the 2030, 2030 commitment. And our high tech solution was buttons. We printed up buttons. So they say no emails went out, nothing. Just stand at the coat check and, hand, and we have a list of firms that have signed up and those that haven't. Excuse me, sir, you're know, welcome. You know, I'm Doug, who are you? Go up. Um, tell me what firm you're with. Oh, wow, you guys are doing great work. Thank you so much. We're really proud of what you're doing with 2030. Would you like a button for the night? Great. Hey, sir, what, well, what firm are you with? Oh, geez, I'm really sorry. Your firm's name is not on this list. But we'll be here next year. Have a good night. So we've been doing that for two years now. So um, you know, all the, the people that get awards all work for firms that get all the buttons, so, which is pretty cool. So we just this, this last summer required it that firms to win to apply for an award had to be 20, 30 signatories. So what is it that architects want? They want to win awards and have social standing in their group. They can't get it until they sign up for this. So it is introducing an impediment. And look at this. So this was the, when we started this campaign, this was the enrollment by a number of firms in Chicago. It was kind of our first, uh, this is leading up, we just finished the, that year. Our first year with the button campaign was that red spike. And then this last year was that. So, Monty, somebody showed that CO2 line going straight up. Buttons are driving architects to go straight up. So, so it goes down to this is community organizing. This is block. I'm, when I with that clipboard at the Kochek, who am I? I'm a block captain. I'm in your face. I told you I'm going to be here next year and the whole thing. And I'll just close with these two slides. Um, I've come to believe this, and this may not be the proper thing to say to a, a realtor audience, but um, you know, we're all part of a multi-generational opportunity or challenge. I mean, we always have been. Uh, the one that faces us now is quite urgent uh, about climate, so you know, think about multi-generations. And I've come to believe that because this, this information, this challenge is potentially so heavy and so dark that you just have to throw the best parties. So to, to, as primary research, uh, I've gone to Burning Man uh, in the desert for three three years now, trying to figure out what a best party looks like, and I've got a pretty good idea. So anyway, uh, one of the patterns in the book is everyone should once a year have a Burning Man party. We could talk about that at the bar. Thanks. It's it's always great to be here, and it's you know it's a it's a great opportunity to be in a city that I was born in. So it's always nice to come back home. And your football team is doing well. Your uh, University of uh, Minnesota football team is ranked. That's doing well. Your hockey team, a little so-so, um, but it, it's, it's a great place to be. It's a great opportunity for me to be here and share things that are can be very different than what you've heard most of today, because I'm going to be talking more about the opportunities and the challenges from a real estate perspective, and that really brings, I think, it all together as we kind of close off here. So where is the clicker? There it is. Um, so, my, my uh, presentation calls the, the following uh, agenda here. I'm going to give you some headlines that you're likely to see in the next few years. Things that are going to cause you to say things are changing in our world and things that you should be aware of. I'm going to tell you why we're at this place in the transformative society and our transformative part of our industry. And obviously, the whole sustainability issue is part of that. Um, I'm going to tell you where we are in our cycles because we can talk about these things but there is a supply demand issue. There is a capital markets issue. There is things that occur that have to be tied together relative to being able to actualize what we've been talking about all day today. I'm going to tell you what happens when a cycle peaks. I'm going to give you a, a quick outlook on the industrial space here um, and also talk about why I really love this area. I really like the Port Authority. I like what's going on here. Um, and I'll give you some predictions which you're likely to hear and see going on in the next five to ten years. So let me get started right here. As Monty said this morning, there's 400 slides. I'm down to my last 300, so stay with me. Um, but we'll get this all done. 
So what are some headlines you're likely to see? Do not be surprised to see a headline like this in the future, where shipping containers become a new housing option. We've been talking about things as if they're new designs we have to do, but there's things that exist today that can be solving that. There are 700,000 shipping containers as an example. And I do this here. And I hit the slide. So this is already an existing project using shipping containers to build apartment buildings. So it's not always about new design. It's also about making sure that we're using what might exist today. Now, I'd be surprised to see a headline like this, where Apple announces a new iOffice technology, creating the, vir the first virtual office building. Oftentimes, we talk about, well, we have to build these sustainable buildings. We also need to talk about the changing nature of work and how work is dramatically changing, because that also affects us. And so people like Apple and Google and others are creating space that is not going to have any environmental impact because it's going to be done up in space. And so when you begin to look at that, understand that as we begin to look at these things here, that the new technology is going to create office buildings in space. You will see that headline in the near future. I think you're going to see this come up very quickly, where the federal government is going to announce that there's going to be a certification requirement for property managers, meaning that if you're going to get a federal loan, if you're going to get an FDIC-insured kind of a loan or anything through the GSEs, that you may have to be certified. This will be driven by banks and by lenders and others to get certifications. That's where the certifications for the CPM and ultimately it could be USGBC. You'll be honestly by the headline like this, where it comes up here, where robots construct the first industrial building in St. Paul. We talk about these things here, but don't forget robotics, automation, artificial intelligence is going to affect our building platforms, our building designs, and how things are done. And therefore, we talk about people in space, but in reality, these buildings are going to be built by robots. These are being done today in China. These are technologies out there today. It's going to affect how these things go off in the future. Do not be surprised to see a headline like this, where 10% of all warehouse space is used in the cultivation of marijuana. It's a growing, absolutely growing, growing field. The point of this is not about this particular headline, but in fact, we're using buildings differently. Buildings will become places to grow urban farms, places where we can grow. And marijuana is just an example of how people have used a building to create a demand for a product that's consumable. And you can grow corn and you can grow wheat and you can grow you know, carrots and vegetables and all those things inside buildings. And so that green building, in fact, could be an urban farm. So don't be surprised to have a headline like that. Do not be surprised to see another headline like this where Google and all the other technology firms are moving rapidly into controlling the data. And if you're in the real estate space today and you're using CoStar and you're using all the other places that are using other brokers, this is all about controlling space and controlling data. And so Google and others are in an active campaign to control data. The data points about how a tenant behaves, the tenant points about energy, the data points about everything that occurs in that building. Do not be surprised to see someone like Google move into that space in a very, very rapid way. Don't be surprised to see a headline like this, where Amazon launches its first flying warehouse. They already have submitted a patent for a flying warehouse that will be up in space. Goods will move up into space, and then what will they be done? They're going to be, this is one of their Amazon Air Force they're designing right now, to move the goods down to the consumer. That changes it. So sometimes our solutions are based on what reality is today, or where things are going, then in fact it changes the whole dynamic. You talk about driverless cars and energy efficient cars. Wait a minute, it's coming out of space. How does this work? How does it change the dynamics of what's going to go happen in our industry? And this will happen in things like that. My last headline you might likely see here where driverless cars are under 50% of parking garages obsolete. Another opportunity. But things begin to change. And so our industry is in this place of tremendous transformative change. And this change is occurring on, this, on a number of events. There's about 30 different things that are happening right here. All of these are happening simultaneously. The abundance of capital, legacy, generation, a generational shift, demographic shifts, a changing nature of work, internet of everything. All these things right now are occurring in our industry simultaneously. 
which means that if you thought you were doing something today, it's not going to be the reality tomorrow. It's not about doing different things. It's about doing things differently. You've got to make sure you're getting outside where you are and making sure that you take a look at these kind of transformative events. Can you see on this, or is that a light bright too, too bright for people over here? Okay, I didn't know. Okay, perfect. Um, we're also shifting in our industry from a geocentric industry, I say our industry, the real estate space, from a geocentric to a knowledge-centric space. We're moving much more in away from the geocentric personality and the customer, way up into relationships, way up into the knowledge and information that comes from there. Because why? We're moving from buildings to customers. The building is merely a physical space, but it's what goes inside the four walls that is the most dynamic part of it. It's where you live, it's where you work, it's how you spend most of your time is in those places. So a much more customer-centric, solutions-based Solutions-based ideas are the way that our industry is moving. And we're clearly moving from on-site to online. The use of the internet for all kinds of things that are out there today, the, no, the new technologies that are out there, prop tech technologies that are being developed, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars in prop tech is being invested right now to really shift into much more predictive analytics. Well, we know what the customer wants. We know how the customer can behave. We know how to use their workspace more effectively, whether it's climate control, whether it's lighting, whether it's seating, whatever it needs, it's going to be a much more predictive in the use of big data. That changes the nature of how we have to look at the world in this whole sphere of environmental sustainability. So where are we in the real estate cycle? Let me explain to you that the real estate cycle is driven by many, many things. All of these factors are up here. All are, are impactful on where we are in a, in a cycle. But in a cycle, you can talk about, let's do this, let's do this. But the reality is, if these cycle is changing, then it changes the nature of demand. It changes the nature of customers. It changes the nature of investments. It changes the nature of, of how things are developed and leased and managed. But these are all occurring simultaneously. And interestingly enough, in the last 50 years, the last five decades, every single real estate cycle has started on a year that ended two, three, or four, and every single real estate cycle has ended on a year that has a seven, eight, or a nine, and we're in 2019 today. The last 50 years, it's always been that way. And so when you see that today, where are we? Right now, we're at the peak of our cycle, and you will see my projections when they go on in terms of what's going on in, in your space, in your you know, industrial space and office space and things, but we're at that peaking period where we're going to have some periods of slowdown, some periods of change. And in those cycles, all of them have names. And I'll just, if you take a look at the 20, sort of 13 period right now, which is finished, the 2013 to 2018 period right in there was that age of capital, asset, and entity rebalancing. The amount of capital that went into our industry in terms of buying assets, and selling assets, repositioning assets, core funds, value-add funds, core plus, all these things began to occur right in there. And then that transition period right now going from one cycle to another, but we're clearly moving to accelerators and technology disruption. And that will be in design. It will be in the things that we've talked about, we've heard today, innovation, new green technologies. All this begins to happen. As we move even forward from there, you will see Clearly, buildings in, this, in space, we will have use of the ocean in far more uh, uh, commercial manner than we are today. You're going to see much more changes that begin to happen, which I always look upon these things as not a problem, but an opportunity. These are things that create incredible opportunities for everybody in this room. So when you look at that, you've got to begin to say, each of you has to look at your business models and what happens here because we're no longer worrying about personalities dominated by knowledge, facts, information. We're much more collaborative, much more virtual integration. We clearly are, are focusing on customers because we can build all these wonderful buildings, but if no one occupies them, what have we accomplished? If we have not improved worker productivity, what have we accomplished? If you have not improved worker wellness, what have we accomplished? And so as these things change, your models have to change relative to how you look at approaching these challenges. And so each of you today, when you go home and you go back and look at your company, in my opinion, you have these choices. When you're at a peaking period of a cycle, 
you can decide to stay the course and just do what you've always done. Build the buildings the way you've always done them, finance them the way you've always done them, minor adjustments, moderate, major, or reinvent. You've heard today for the last several hours here some incredible ideas on how you can really make a difference, move the needle. But that requires you to reinvent yourself because no one in a cycle change has to experience a downturn if, in fact, you've reinvented yourself. No one does. But if you stay the course and always do what you did the day before, you're going to have a, a clearly, clearly some challenges going forward. And here's some clear proof points. You can say, Chris, okay, that's a nice idea, but show me some proof points. Okay, here they are. These are all asset sales in the U.S. of real estate properties. Look at the wave-like effect. I'm just trying to show you the wave-like effect, the yellow the up and down. Clearly, there we're at a peak period of asset sales. Take a look at Minneapolis. That's Minneapolis, St. Paul. But there it is, the same wave. So you have a peak, a down, and a peak. We're at a peaking point. How about loan originations from the Mortgage Bankers Association? The same wave-like effect, peaking and now slowing down. Another sign that our market is at a change point. NAREIT, National Investment Association of Real Estate Investment Trust, the REITs, okay? The two lowest periods in the REIT side were 1998 and 2008. And up here, it's peaking. But it's even higher than people expected. Why? Because it's paying dividends. <laughs> it's doing things that other asset, other securities are not doing today. But in fact, REITs are having some big challenges going forward. Green Street, one of the great premier uh, advisory firms to pension funds and life insurance companies, right there since about oh, 12 to 18 months ago, that green line has not measurably changed at all. And no one at Green Street thinks that green line is going out to the top of the ceiling. No one thinks it's going to go that way. So what happens here is a symbol of things that are getting peaking. So what happens here? Construction is slowing down. Third quarter, you can just see construction activity begins to slow. Things change. But this, to me, is an opportunity, which you've heard today about these sustainable buildings, because now I have a chance to make a difference when I'm putting things on the ground today. It's not going to be coming out for two or three years. So I have a chance to make real impacts today that I'm going to get benefits from when they come out and are fully occupied. If you are hearing or experiencing any of these things in your marketplace today, any of these issues here, or you have fewer feasible deals, and I hear that across the country, it's too cost too expensive, I can't get the yields, I can't get the, all the issues that come from the capital markets, M&A, rent construction, fee pressures, all of these things, if any of these things are occurring, it's a symbol that your market is in fact peaking, and your market is going to change, and that changes upon you. Very simple too, another proof point here, this is U.S. corporate debt to GDP, there's the same cyclical nature of what occurs across the country. Same thing happens here. U.S. corporate debt is a percent of GDP. The same bubble effects, the same things that we're now in, I call the everything bubble, okay? And as that begins to happen, there's going to be fundamental changes. It's happening right this minute, and you'll see the impacts in 2020 and 2021. Whoops, they hit the wrong. Okay, so what happens in terms of, of asset classes? Well, if you take a look at the industrial, which is obviously why you're, why you're here today, it has been one of the best performing asset classes of, of all of them over the last several years. Why? Mostly for the last mile, mostly for the changing nature of consumerism, the changing nature of how goods are moved and distributed in this country. And many of those industrial buildings were not energy efficient. They are not efficient for the new technology, the new stacking systems, the new ways in which goods can be moved in and out. Cold storage and those things drive that kind of result. I don't want to be in retail, do I? Why? You can see the same with the Amazon effect, the things that happen today. So industrial is a good place to be, and that whole space is exciting. But you also see when markets change, that fundraising does decline, and that fundraising on global funds has declined at the end of last year, clearly in that regard here. And the trends through the, the last quarter here of 2019 you can see the number of funds and capital that has been raised has gone down. So we've had this huge abundance of capital, 
but they all recognize that the market is changing and we are slowing down. As a result of that, we're going to see fewer transactions, we're going to see fewer activity until the market corrects and cures itself going forward. Now, not all markets are the same and not all places are the same. And then you'll hear why I like this area more than I like some other areas of the country. But as you see that here, these are just proof points. But you are a city of, and I call Minneapolis, St. Paul, that whole MSA. You are a tale of two cities, you know, like Dickinson novel here. Um, because if you see here, you've got statistics that are very positive. You have population growth, household growth, employment growth, education and health services uh, jobs are growing. All of these things are positive. But in fact, some of the other things are, are, are becoming more concerning. And if you have government jobs, which is growing, I don't know if that's a good thing for you or not, but the problem is it's going to have to pay out somebody's taxes. Um, but construction jobs are flat. Populate, the net, natural, the natural, not the in-migration, the natural population increase, for example, is flat. So all of that hook is, is the negative side, but the positive side of what's going on here says your market is going to be more resilient during the next three to four years while other parts of the country are going to experience some slowdowns. So you have positive things that are happening here, and that's exciting. If you take a look at the industrial side, which is to give you the quick outlook for here, because industrial, oops, I don't know why I keep doing that, um, is that right now workers are producing a lot more. And we talk about buildings as if they're buildings. I, I, I don't like the building conversations because it's what's inside the building that really is occurring here. And right now, workers are producing more work. Amazon has over 100,000 robots today working uh, alongside humans in, inside the fulfillment center here. There's almost 2 million industrial robots here. There's going to be 128,000 uh, cobots in the U.S. All of this thing begins to stimulate that, in fact, the nature of work and what is going on in the buildings is different. When we talk about the things that are there, we also have to talk about, well, who's working in the building? Maybe it's robots and not humans. Well, how does that affect how you design the building? How does that affect the environmental issues? Because they're going to be, have to be plugged in, right? I mean, robots are great. You don't have to feed them. You don't have to do anything. Kick them out. You know, there's no breaks. Everything's cool. No vacations, no overtime. But the problem is you've got to charge them up. How does that work? How is it going to work? And the emergence of the, the fetch robot, um, you know, which is a you know, funny little thing here. But these little guys are out here. They can go fetch anything, anywhere, any place. There's no human involved at all. I've toured the Amazon facility. I just toured their new one in Denver uh, a few months ago. And you, it's the most inhumane place you ever want to be. But it was designed for robots, not for humans. And so as these continue to go on here, I wish my kid was this when she was a teenager. She could, you know, go get me a beer. She'd just go out and get it and come back. But, didn't work that way. Um, but as that happens, it just means that that changes. But the same thing occurs here when you look at just, I gave you all asset classes of sales. Look at what's happening here, that Amazon effect has caused a massive uptick in new buildings, new you know, construction of new distribution, warehouse distribution facilities. And those are opportunities. And all those that service them have the same way going about that. I haven't even talked about 3D manufacturing. It's another impact that will happen along the way. So you see that, again, we're at that incredible peaking place of desire. Here's all the sales, for, sales information for industrial. Again, look at that in a normal wave, but that wave, in fact, has you seen peaking, why, I mean, you know, increasing because of that Amazon effect. I cannot tell you how much that has changed. It's changed retail, it's changed consumerism, it's changed industrial, it's changed a lot of habits. Uh, and patterns in this country. And so what you look at it here, from all sales of all real estate assets in the industrial space in this country, the arrows are primarily going up here. And in Minneapolis, St. Paul, they went up in 17, they went up in 18. Which means that your market and your, and your assets are of need, of desire. They want to be there. And when you build a green building, you build a more value-add building, that adds even more cachet to the whole transaction, and it causes those things to go up. So you are moving in the right direction with respect to that kind of an asset class. But because of the nature of the changing real estate cycle, you're going to see lower returns over the next few years because of the nature of the slowing down of the economy, for sure, it's slowing down. Um, and that begins to change the nature of returns on assets. 
So we can talk about, well, we can get the efficiency of building, we can save this on energy and save this on that, but we also have to know that we have to get rent. <laughs> and if the rents aren't there, it's gonna be awful hard to get some of those returns. Um, so you take a look here, the projections for Minneapolis-St. Paul on the industrial space side here, you can see that the next couple of years are gonna be somewhat of a challenge, and then it's gonna be accelerating back. So if I'm looking to come out of a marketplace of a downturn, I wanna start doing things now, 19, 20, or 21. So when the market is changing, I've got the asset already done, already built, already underway. I can put those tenants in there and move forward. But because you're also resilient, you have an opportunity to capture people who want to be here because of the workforce, because of the educated workforce, and because of the opportunities that exist. And that's good. So you do have to future-proof your buildings. You do have to build sustainable beauty buildings. And I think they represent the best investment opportunity right now. Absolutely one of the best opportunities. Um, and if you look at that, you say, well, then how, what is the best place to, you know, to do this? How do, you, how do you create that? And so what we do is we looked at across the country and said, okay, what are the characteristics of, of great growth markets? What are the great places that happen along the way there? And you can see colleges and universities and incentives and employment growth, some of the stuff that, that uh, uh, St. Paul uh, the Port Authority has uh, uh, along the way there. But each one of the digital infrastructure, economic growth, uh, walkability scores, sports. And the bottom side here is, uh, is are you future ready? Is Minneapolis St. Paul future ready? You take a look at that, you absolutely are. Of all the studies that I reviewed, all the information that I've gone through, you are in this class, what they call a current future city prepared. You are there prepared for tomorrow. We've talked a lot today about building for tomorrow, building buildings that are sustainable, reducing the carbon footprint, making ourselves an example for the rest of the people, using that block by block te you know, uh, technique to go out and get that done. But that's where you are today. And you're up there competing with other cities that are there, but not all cities fall in that category. You're one of those, and that's what's exciting about that. The same thing, though, when you look at these trends that we've heard today, and all kinds of trends are there. But there's 80,000, roughly, or so, commercial lead uh, buildings today worldwide. 33,000 um, certified USGBC members or, or big buildings um, uh, out there today as well. Um, green buildings account for 2 billion square feet uh, out. CDC and GSA have a, a whole health workplace environment rating system that's out there. The Well Building Institute, I don't know how many of you use that, but the Well Building Institute, you go out and, you, and you, there's a wellness rating you get for, for how well the employees, uh, you know, the, the air and the lighting and the opportunities that they have to work in a more productive environment. Each of these particular things, the, light, the living building challenge is a gold standard right now, absolutely gold standard for building environmental buildings, environmental ratings. Um, and so as these things grow and change, what happens is people get on board, very similar to what we just talked about a few minutes ago, where people, whether it's a block by block and neighborhood by neighborhood, and you continue to build, so you get a lot more things that go mainstream. Companies like this begin to all join in. Oh, this is great. You heard that from Brandon this morning. You saw the number of people that signed up there. This is a, becoming a very mainstream thing and you've got to be on board. You've got green building resource partners. Every one of these is out there looking to help you in any way, shape, or form. You have a different number of rating, rating uh, entities all out there, and there's others beside that. But each one of these can give you different goals. It's not just one, it's not just GBC or Energy Star or whatever, but all of them provide opportunities that I think are very, very positive. So why do I like St. Paul? Why do I like the Port Authority? I think the biggest reason, and when I did, before coming here, I did a lot of research. I tried to figure out, okay, I'm coming here to talk, but you know, is this really the place to be? But what I found is I really liked about that you were investing in the future. You were investing for tomorrow, not trying to be like everyone was yesterday. That Hillcrest Golf Course acquisition was a good thing. Net zero energy, that 60,000 square foot warehouse that just was just was uh, developed here. The, the Working River PBS special, another way of showing the value of this particular site and area. You can just look at the list. All those there. I'm Minnesota Pace, I'm in Pace. Um, over 100 million projects, 100 million dollars of projects funded. That's going to be the difference. 
that capital formation, that capital way to help incentivize and motivate people to do things here is going to be the tipping point for many, many people who want to come here. And as these things to happen, these are all very, very positive things. But as we begin to look at it and say, well, then where the future is, where is the future going to hold here? I'm going to show you just some, end up with some predictions, things that you are likely to see over the next few years, things that are going to, you're going to say, well, is that true or is that, how is that going to happen here? So my first prediction is the following. I think you're going to see across this country um, more and more higher green taxes on a community level or county level or a state level fines and penalties for buildings that are not operationally green compliant, I think that's going to happen. I don't know if it's not going to come from the federal government as much as it will come from local communities and things that are there. So if your building's not, how do I buy a building, how do I develop a building, how do I sell a building if it's not green compliant? Those are things that are going to come forward. I think you're going to see green escrows um, requirements that if you sell a building, you're going to see that that you're going to have to escrow monies to build, to convert the billing to that green, minimal green standard on the new buyer. So whatever that sale is, if it's going to cost a million dollars or half a million dollars or two million, whatever it is, you're going to have to escrow monies in order to convert that billing to green. You talk about a policy change. Those are the kind of policy changes people are talking about, I hear across the country, or things like that may be occurring. That's going to have a huge impact on owners and operators and sellers but to the extent that happens, watch for that. And they might just come up and say, oh, by the way, you, if you don't want to be putting the escrow money up, but you cannot use a federally insured bank, FDIC a bank. You can't use a GSE. You know, you can't use that. Um, and pretty soon the insurance companies will say, well, we can't do it either. Well, who's going to give you the debt? Where's the debt going to come from? And so these are the kind of things that might happen. I think you're going to watch clearly... Uh, Watch for amenities and walkability and access to mass transit options to command a premium. Those locations that are next to light rail systems, those locations that are located to great places to walk and enjoy food, restaurants, entertainment, just relaxation, things of that nature are going to have a higher premium value because we're creating these pods of incredible interactive activity for people across the country. And that's going to happen very soon. I think that's going to happen by 2025 for sure. I think there's examples of that beginning to occur right now. I told you about the growing marijuana, so don't be surprised again to see commercial buildings, high-rise buildings, used as uh, uh, urban farms. Uh, urban farms, which cost you too much money to bring the goods all the way in from you know, wherever they come from here and then process them, that can all be done. Those of you who have been to Disney World, you know, you're taking that little boat, you see all those big melons that are out there and all that kind of stuff. It grows. Marijuana grows nonstop. You put things in buildings, it's lighting is 24 hours a day because you have solar power, you have all that. You can have lighting, you can have no bugs, no insects, no diseases, you can have no water evaporation. It could all be you know, watered very, very carefully. So all that can occur very efficiently in a building. Watch for that to happen in the next few years. In fact, it's already happened in other parts of the world, but this is in, in the U.S. I think you'll watch for regulations that require all property managers to be licensed and green certified. I think that's going to happen. And whether it's BOMA or IRAM or ICSC or NAOP or whatever, but they're going to see some licensing requirements that are going to say, how can our people be efficient and effective in the things that are impacting us as a nation, impacting us as an industry, impacting our communities? I think you'll see 60 to 70 percent of the property tours that are being done, that be done virtually uh, through, you know, expanding that whole investor base. So I can be in Hong Kong or Bolivia or Germany or whatever, and I can go take visual tours. I can do everything I need to do without being there. Opening up the capital markets to assets all over the world is going to be an incredible opportunity. Telling your story, telling the Port Authority's story, telling Minnesota's story, telling those stories now becomes much more available because of this technology, and you're going to see those kind of things being done very quickly. Um, who's in brokerage? Just raise your hand if you're a broker today. Okay, you're toast. Uh, no. Um, I'm just kidding. That's okay. Uh, give, them a free, give them a free admission next year. Um, I think you're going to see public-private partnerships uh, begin to really change. And you're seeing that here. This is something that Monty's talked about a lot, what they're doing here at the Port Authority here. 
but I think it's going to see these partnerships are going to constitute 25 to 35 percent of urban redevelopment opportunities. You cannot do it alone any, any alone anymore. You have changes of uh, changes of of, uh, of uh, planning requirements. You have to have changes in maybe parking uh, requirements. That's the biggest issue now because if we go driverless cars, they don't use many spaces. How do I do this? These are going to be partnerships. How can I build and use that infrastructure that might happen from a from a, uh, a, a, a municipal partner, a quasi partner, and the developer? I watch clearly going to see that every building is going to have to have a score. It's going to have a carbon footprint score, a sustainable rating. And you're going to see that required before you get planning approval in many cities. Um, there are technologies out there today that are doing that. There's other cities, like in Portland or someone that has that. Um, but this technology where you're going to have a scorecard because it's a way of injecting more of a, of a sustainable focus on how you're, where you're getting your lumber, where you're getting your steel, where you're getting your concrete, what you're buying. Um, and that's going to happen. And so that rating, that footprint thing here, is going to be something that everyone who's investing in real estate is going to have to look at very, very carefully. I think you're going to see new technology advancements uh, and new building materials um, that are really going to change the whole you know, structure. Um, there is technology today with these windows. 3M has a window now that if you touch the window, it can become a multimedia screen. It can become a computer screen. It can show movies. And the multifamily industry right now is looking at that as saying, wait a minute, I don't want to be as big a space. I can use the windows now for things for multimedia. I don't have to use a window just for a window. I can have windows that obviously um, generate energy uh, as a result of that. So these technologies and new building materials begin to make things much more exciting, much more dynamic as the changing nature of what happens. PropTech. You've got to follow PropTech. If you're anywhere in real estate, I don't care what place you're in, architecture, design, uh, brokerage, or whatever, you've got to follow what's going on here. The new technologies that are being developed and being uh, um, deployed, about to be deployed in many cases, are going to have a huge impact on jobs in the real estate space. You know, eliminating and reducing, in fact, some people talk about eliminating maintenance, eliminating all the maintenance, eliminating some of the property management, buildings under 200,000 square feet being managed by, you know, uh, re remotely with robots and others that are there. Um, I don't know whether that's going to happen. But there are people investing hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars into that space to see what that is. Um, and almost if you had a single tenant, that's a different way. But again, it's clearly going to impact some of the jobs that are out there today. Construction, probably the biggest impact of all. I think you're going to watch for the, the green lease, something that Omani, you guys have, have worked on here. Um, but the green lease, I think, is going to be, going to be mandated. It's going to be mandated by lenders, mandated by insurers and institutional. And it, whether it's a green lease or the obligation of a tenant to do certain recycling requirements, you know, to have that recycling of paper, and, um, you know, what, what do they do with their uh, printer cartridges or whatever it is, all that stuff there is going to have requirements to do that. So that green lease is going to change. I think when you have green lease, it enhances the value of the asset, enhances the quality. Now people are making a difference there. So watch for that to happen in the next few years. Uh, watch for office space to have its own version of Airbnb. Office space is going to be leased just like a multifamily now is going to start being leased by the week and by the month. It's not going to be 12-month leases anymore. The same thing is going to apply to office. People are going to be able to do just like they have an Airbnb and they can take space down. There's companies already working very diligently on this particular thing to have their own Airbnb on space. So what does that mean for a tenant that comes in for one month, six months, two months? You know, It changes the nature, doesn't it? It changes what we're doing. And how do they become enrolled in the kind of things we've been talking about here today? I think insurance companies are going to offer premiums. If you clearly have a certified green building, I'm not suggesting it's going to be USGBC, but it's some form, whether it's Energy Star or something. But in fact, the premium, a different rate, and lenders might offer a different rate. The same kind of thing applies. Where the green buildings are going to get benefits, I think you're going to see that kind of policy changes begin to occur. I think that by 2025, about 15% of all commercial buildings will be green certified. And that's not just USGBC, but like the Energy Star and others. It's around 11% today. But that percentage could jump up to 30% at least by 2030, 20% uh, by 2030. So we are in the right trajectory. The things that we were just talked about uh, before, before, in fact, all day today, is how we can accelerate that. The more we can change, the more we can move the needle, the more you can become an example, the more the Port Authority can become an example, the better that is to cause that catalytic effect to move much quicker. 
Um, I think these green addendums uh, requirements um, will be very localized kind of activity. I think robots are going to capture probably five to six percent of construction activity. There are already technologies, particularly in multifamily and others, they're building these just like, a, it'd be like um, uh, Legos on steroids, you know, um, and that's kind of what they're looking at here. So as you begin to look at that, there's robots, and my biggest concern about in a society, you didn't ask me, but I'm going to tell you, um, is always not about the sustainability, it's what are we going to do with all these people? What are we going to do with people whose jobs are eliminated with robotics and automation? And, What's going to, with construction, we don't need them anymore. What, what are these people going to do? So we have, we have this social thing over here about in sustainability. We also have this people thing over here about what happens to these people if the jobs are eliminated because of the technology that exists today. Automation, offshoring, automa uh, automation, uh, artificial intelligence. Um, it can be a challenge. Uh, don't be surprised to see an occupier wellness advisor that has to sign off on every single building design before it goes to planning commission. Just like an architect has to sign, you're going to have someone who's going to have to certify that that building has an occupier wellness factor for the employees that work in there that has all the features that cause that to be not only sustainable, but more importantly, a wellness factor for the people that work in there. And that's going to be something you might see over the next few years. And I think you're going to see, my last one here, is I think you're going to see a change of, of the words from green buildings to building green. Uh, we've got to take a more momentum statement rather than a passive statement. Um, so these are exciting times. All of these times here represent, in my opinion, opportunity. There's approximately 250 million square feet in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area, excluding multifamily. 250 million square feet. Take a pick. 5% is green. I don't care where. 10% is green. That's 225 million square feet that's not. That, to me, is a tremendous, tremendous opportunity for redevelopment, reconversions, as well as new development activity. And those who lead and those who take a step out and move that needle, just like Brandon was talking about, when it went out there and got rid of that shit that he talked about here, he took the step. He got out there and he did it. And that's an example, though. They have a great firm, and it's an example of how firms have to step up but they need the partnerships with the Port Authority, they need a partnership with the community, they need a partnership with the lenders, the capital partners, the investors. They need to be partnerships to make this happen. So I view these as a, a, clearly a glass half full. I think it's tremendous, tremendous opportunities. I thank you for the time you let me present it. Rick. Hey, Rick. Thank you all. Uh, I'm gonna